Welcome to the Health Leader Forge, a joint production between the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. My name is Mark Bonica, and I am an assistant professor in the University of New Hampshire's Department of Health Management and Policy. Today's guest is Chris DeNicola. Chris is a healthcare entrepreneur working in the field of addiction services. I stumbled onto Chris's organization after reading about a new barbershop in Nashua, New Hampshire, that was run by recovering addicts and catering in particular to those in recovery. It turned out Rise Barbershop was just one of a number of ventures Chris is responsible for. I spoke with Chris at his Process Recovery Center, one of two treatment facilities he and his partners own. They also operate sober living houses, which provide safe and supportive housing communities for recovering addicts with a total of 170 beds in New Hampshire and Massachusetts. What is particularly interesting about Chris and his partners is that they are also all recovering addicts. So the businesses are a manifestation of their passion to help others who have suffered from the same challenges. This is one of the longer interviews I've done, so I'll be posting two versions. This is the full-length version. If you'd like to listen to the abridged version, please see our website, healthleaderforge.org, for the link. Also, if you enjoy this podcast, won't you leave us feedback on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or wherever you may be accessing this recording. It helps other people discover us. Thanks for listening, and here is Chris Nicola. So welcome to the podcast, Chris. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So, um, so I read about, I, f I found out about um, your organization through uh, an article in the Nashua Telegraph talking about your Rise Barbershop and uh, had a chance to have my hair cut this morning by Seth, one of the gentlemen that's working there. And they were passionate about the business and passionate about the services that you're providing here in Nashua. So excited to, to learn a little bit about kind of your background and, and how this has all come about. Absolutely. So I don't, I'm, I'm not sure where to really start. So we're going to be talking about addiction services and, yep. and kind of some of the, the different services that you're providing, you know, in Nashua. And so how did you come to be involved in, in these kinds of services? Oh, so, I mean, to essentially go back to the beginning, um, how I ended up here, it's, it's such like a, well, first and foremost, I'm an addict in long-term recovery. Uh, a lot of people don't like the term addict. I'm comfortable with it. So I suffer from substance use disorder, which is the appropriate term to use. And so I've been clean for 15 years. I've been in long-term recovery for 15 years. And um, what essentially led me to this point is my journey through recovery and uh, my journey through a lot of my experiences in life and, and just being young. I was 20, 21 years old when I was uh, first, when I finally got this, uh, close to 22 years old, and I had been struggling with substance use from uh, a very young age. And so I came into recovery um, naive, uh, ignorant to what it was that I suffered from. And I just had like a lot of learning and a, lo a lot of stuff that, uh, that I hadn't experienced. I don't know how far or how deep you want me to get into like my story. Or, yeah, I'd like but, to hear it. I'd, I'd like to, so when did you start? How did you, how did you get in, into substance use? How, how did that come about? So my generation I call as a part of the Purdue Farmer generation, which was the Oxycontin boom. Okay. Um, that's when OCs were just everywhere. When I was in high school, I believe it was like my freshman, sophomore year. There was a lot of people doing Oxycontin and um, it was the first drug that really came around that really didn't have uh, like, obviously there was like the stoners and then there was like the, there was like what you would call a druggie. And then there was just like all these different groups and then like Oxycontins came around. They were kind of like everybody was uh, dabbling with them. And so me, I was always an experimenter from a, from a young age. And, um, yeah. and so I went through like my marijuana phases. I went through like alcohol. Yeah. I, I was a very resistant child. I think a lot of that stemmed from looking back in retrospect I, I mean i had a fought my father was in, in prison my whole life from the age of well, just 10 12 years he got out of jail when i was 18 i was raised by my stepfather and um i don't know i had like a lot of like internal pain and stuff that was going on so i was always seeking out something outside of myself for relief and uh 
I found myself kind of um, gravitating towards like all the different groups of like I, I didn't belong to any one specific stoner, pothead, hallucinogenic, um, jock. I was kind of in the mix of all of them. I didn't do well in school. I was the epitome of um, he, with that statement. He has so much potential. That's that was like the statement about me, like my whole life. If he could only, if he would just, uh, he has so much potential, so much potential, and um. So I was the potential guy, a lot of that. And, and, and I had a loving and caring mother. Um, sometimes I got sent to, to go live with different family members in different places to see if they could help me. Maybe if they changed the environment, changed the school, Chris could. Because I had flashes of like, uh, I could do well for certain lengths of time. Then they put me on, I remember they put me on medication for attention deficit disorder, which it did work when I took it appropriately. But then eventually I started to abuse the... ADD medication and um, pretty sure you're not supposed to sniff it. Um, oh, jeez. <laughs> uh, and so I ended up in New Jersey, Florida, all different types of family members. All while you were in high school? All while I was in high school. I went to uh, wow. three different high schools. So my freshman year, I was at one high school. My sophomore year, I was at another high school. My junior year, I was at a high school in New Jersey. And then my mother let me come back my senior year. And by that time, I had been dabbling and a lot of the opioids, but never too much. And when I came back home, my senior year was when it really exploded. And then once I got introduced like completely to oxys and started to, to do opioids on a daily basis, everything changed for me. So that was the, the full scale transition for me to like severe active addiction. Was there a trigger for that or did it just... Was it, so you said it exploded, are you saying it exploded in you or it was like exploding like around you, everybody was... It was the perfect storm, so it exploded okay. in me and exploded around me, so that it was just so accessible at the time and uh, it was all around and, um, and it was highly addictive and we never know the full extent. I remember the first time I experienced being what they call dope sick, uh, I, I didn't understand what was happening to me because your body becomes chemically dependent. I didn't ever had experience with being like chemically dependent on something to the point where I was physically ill. And uh, I remember I had another friend that was, was also abusing opiates. He told me, he's like, oh, you're dope sick. And I was like, what do you mean? It's like, I just got the flu. You know, cause when you're, when you're, when you're chemically dependent on something, when you're, when you're, you take yourself off of them, you, you, so when you're dope is, when you're actually dope sick, what they call dope sick, you become physically sick, like sweating, restless. You have extreme bowel movements, um, throwing up. It, it's, it's pretty it's awful. awful. Yeah. yeah, it is awful. I remember him telling me, all you have to do is get high again and it'll go away. And I'm like, what? He was like, watch, I promise. And he was like, yeah, do some. And I remember doing some and then the feeling of relief, like all my symptoms, it was like the magical cure to what I had perceived as like this terrible flu. And all of a sudden it was gone. And then that was the change of everything. That's when it became, I was now physically dependent on something because now I knew that this equals this. So the, the use of this will make this go away. And, and that was the, the complete change in the direction of everything. And uh, Were you still enjoying it at that point? Or so was it both, it'll make me sick if I don't do it, but I also enjoy it or, or did it uh, yeah, no, I'd be lying if I said at that point I wasn't, en uh, I wasn't enjoying it because the repercussions weren't as severe yet. Um, obviously, I, was living, I wasn't living the greatest life, but as far as what I perceived as like someone that's like strung out on drugs and committing crimes and all this stuff, I hadn't hit that point yet. And I didn't realize how, how fast I was about to hit that point. The physical dependency, when that takes over with the mixture of now the obsession and compulsion for something, so the, the mental dependency, it was... It was a different animal that was born inside of me. And, and then that just stretched out for three, almost four years of just getting worse and worse and worse. And I became that perception of what I thought an addict was. You know, I became that someone that was untrustworthy, just committing crimes, anything necessary to get the, the next one. It's like my life went on pause and, and the progression of me as, as a human being went nowhere. And my life went in regression, like, it just started to get worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And I was further away from the people that I love, further away from friends that had gone to school. It's like everybody else's life was like getting better. They were moving forward and they were doing all this stuff. And I was stuck in like a 17 year old mindset 
now 18, 19, 20, 21, just getting further of, and further away from any resemblance of a, of a life that, that I could have imagined myself living. So during that period, so you, you eventually reached a point where you, you did enter long-term recovery. Mm -hmm. Did you at any point during those four years of intense addiction try to stop using? I did. I, I had some, so I was battling a few things at that, at that point in time is that I was battling being young at the, at the time. So my first experience with a, with a meeting, my grandfather was, is still in long-term recovery. I think he's got 55 years now. He's also another gentleman that was in prison and uh, found himself in jail. It's, it's, it's actually a cool story. My grandfather, he, he ended up reading the Bible multiple times when he was in prison because he was going to prove that this Jesus guy was, was no good. He was going to find the flaws in him. Okay. And so he, out of spite, read the Bible, just searching for some sort of uh -huh. validation on his opinions of it. And the opposite happened to him. And he was in wow. jail and, and actually found God and then came out and found the program. And he's been and clean ever since. Yeah. Wow. wow. So he, he was my first experience and I wasn't ready to hear what he was trying to, to teach me. And then the meetings that he was bringing me to, they were all older people and they had alcohol problems. And, and I was, I was young at the time and I couldn't identify, I couldn't connect, you know, with what was happening. So I, I immediately just shut off any hopes of hearing anything from sitting there. And then I started to go through the circuit of like, okay, now, now I'm going, I'm getting arrested often. And then now I'm getting stipulated to programs and I'm having to go to different treatment centers. And just even while being in the treatment centers, the, the, the idea of never again anything was always like so hard for me to grasp. So I would always just come up with these, these new ideas of how I was going to do it. Okay, I'm not going to do heroin no more. I'm going to do a combination of marijuana with alcohol or I'm not going to do. And I would try it and I'd come out because I would get clean. I get a little bit of clarity and I tell myself I was going to use differently. Right? I was going to use safely. I was going to be productive. I was going to work a job and just party on Friday and Saturday and then rest on Sunday and all this stuff. And, and so uh, I spent years working out different combinations that never worked for me. And I would just create more unmanageability and create more havoc in my life and continue to push people away and isolate myself from anybody that cared for me. When did you make the transition from pills, oxy uh, to heroin? Pretty, pretty quickly. Cause at that point, um, right when I became physically dependent on the oxys, I'd say it was probably like two to three months. So when I first tried them two to three months and, and then I became physically dependent. So if I didn't use them, I would get sick. And then my, so at that point then oxy 80 was $80 a pill. And so my habit in the beginning was a half of one, which was $40. So I could hustle up $40 somehow. And then it went up to $80. And then my habit went up to two eighties, which was $160 a day. And this is a day. A day. $160 yeah. a day is a lot of money. Oh yeah. That's why we turned Especially real quick. Especially for a 19 year old. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about it. Even if I was working a full-time job right. and like, yeah. I, I still wouldn't have been able to afford it. That's obviously why I transitioned into stealing and, and all that. And then it started to get outrageous where I was at like a $320 a day habit. Heroin is, was 10 times more potent than oxys and it was $40. And if I used it with a hypodermic needle, I could stretch it out even longer than that. I could get a couple days out of it. And so I went from a person that would justify my not as bad as people by, I don't, I don't do heroin. I don't shoot up. I'm not like, like them. And then all of a sudden that, that goes away. That perception goes away and you're just looking to survive and you're like, well, this does make better financial sense for me at this time. It's a lot easier for me to attain and to, yeah. to not be sick. Wow. Yeah, it happens quick, very quick. Like yeah. that, that complete transition to that. So, so what was it that, um, so your grandfather tried to intervene. Mm -hmm. I assume other family members probably were trying to help you. Yep. Um, your grandfather was actually an example of somebody who had been living sober for a long time. Yes. So you had that, but that wasn't, that wasn't enough. No. So what was it that, what was the turning point? What, what, and you went and you said you had gone, you had been forced into recovery yes. a number of times and, yep. it, and you kept negotiating with yourself mm -hmm. ways that you would come out and not 
do that. So what was it that finally, finally caused this switch to flip for you? So the, the beginning transition was, I remember I was in a, a, a treatment center. I was 20 years old at the time. And I was in a lockdown facility. There was 160 guys in there. I had gone through this treatment. It's, it's it, what they call a holding facility. So in, in Massachusetts, you get to a detox. And, and if you're lucky, you, you can get placed into the next phase, which is a holding facility, which is it's like huge. Looks like a jail where you're sharing a room with eight guys. There's one shower with like 20 shower heads where you shower like in a community, like in prison. And there's a cafeteria and... It's pretty intense, especially for me. When I first went there, I was 18, so it was like terrifying. And then by the time I was 20, I was like a seasoned vet in this place. And um, and usually what I would do is I would it would be like recovery time for me. Like I'd be out there ripping, running, getting in trouble, all this stuff. And then I just I couldn't take it no more, so I'd go to detox just to like get some sense of stability to get my my mind back together and then I'd go to the holding facility and and while I was there it would just be to like catch uh, what they call catch rack like see guys that I knew from the streets or from different programs and we would play cards and eat and lift weights and there was never any like talks of anything of like value like depth like oh I, I need to change or or even if I did have some grasp of like wanting to change it would get real cloudy real quick because I didn't even understand completely how I needed to change and the people in that facility, presumably, were probably at the same place as you, right? Yeah. I mean, they're there because they're yep. at that early stage. They had no other choice, essentially. No one was there because they wanted to be there. That was oh, for okay. sure. So yeah. this, was, this is a state man, like a, like a you had state facility. And yeah, so a lot of people were state uh, mandated there. And then there were some people that just had no other place to go. And okay. so they went there not because they were on a path to like change their lives. They were there because like it was the winter time. And it was freezing out. Yeah. And they didn't have a couch to sleep on at that point. So the transition for me, I remember. So the, the groups there were kind of wonky. It was very, it was a state-run facility. So it wasn't like the greatest care not to, I mean, thank God for that place. It played a vital role. But I'm, they would play like documentaries on like black tar heroin for a group. And it's like, why am I watching a documentary on black tar heroin? Like I know know what heroin is and it was, it was just but and, and then there would be like commitments outside commitments and a lot of the time the outside commitments would be like a lot of the people that were at my grandfather's groups like older people they're talking about alcohol just alcohol and they just they tell their drunk a log and then they'd be like and and now life's good and, and I could never connect with that and one night a commitment came in and it was these younger uh, younger guys from um, South Boston and there was a speaker there and his name was Jimmy and he was super highly energetic and he was funny and he was articulate and um, he was talking about something that I hadn't heard um, or maybe I had heard but I just wasn't ready to listen um, but he was talking about something completely different he was talking about the experience of a process of change right like a change in his perception a change in the way that he was thinking and a change in the way that he felt and the freedom that he experienced because of that and he wasn't selling this idea of like now i have a job and now i have this and now i have that because i had heard that before he was selling like i am not the same person that i was when i first walked into these doors i do not think the same i do not feel the same and not only that but i'm also evolving into something new there's a newer version of me that's 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 come to light and he was speaking from a place of truth he exposed his his vulnerabilities he exposed his his human frailty and where he fell short and like his process of like what he was doing to like work through that pain and where he's currently at now and he would introduce like humor into because obviously the, the second someone has a, uh, experience with a, a certain defect of character you can find some comedy in the in the in the actual like understand like yeah yeah i did that too and then to have them say like i no longer am required to live like that and i remember him talking about he he no longer has the need from for validation from other people and i could identify with that so much like that requirement of like not having the capabilities to make yourself feel good so we're always seeking outside of ourselves so like uh, validation stems from like you telling me that i'm doing good you telling me that i look good you telling me that it's like I, I was reliant on other people to, to, to fill me up, to build me up. I couldn't do it alone. 
I couldn't do it for myself. I didn't know how to practice self-love. I didn't know how to do all these things or to generate positive emotions for myself or positive thinking. And so I was reliant on whether it be if a female thought I was attractive or if a male thought I was cool or if you thought that I looked like I was working out or uh, whatever it was, I was like reliant on that. And if I couldn't get that, I'd seek it somewhere else from something else. And uh, is that how does that play into the drug use? essentially that's all with the drug use even from a young age i can always see myself essentially what i was doing in a lot of those moments was i was trying to to to, to escape reality whatever my circumstances were i didn't have the ability to communicate yet honestly i was too i was in a place of fear even though i had such a loving mother that would accept my truth no matter what i didn't know how to articulate yet what it was that i was experiencing or what what my emotions were or or feelings of like my father was gone, my biological father, and then I, I was raised by my stepfather, who was an amazing man, and he did right by me the best he could. He was 23 years old, and like, I thought that I knew what, so we'll start from when my father got arrested and went to jail, I was four years old, and I, uh, five years old, and I can remember because he would come to baseball games, and then all of a sudden he wasn't there, and I still have that memory in me looking over to the fence and him not being there, and then so that was my first experience of like that abandonment, not even knowing that I was experiencing that. And then I had my stepfather who, who came in and he loved me the best that he could. He was young. He had no experience with being a dad. He, he came in and he took care of me and my sister who were from another man. Now, mind you, I look exactly like my biological father. So I can't imagine what it's like for him to have a little mini reminder of <laughs> my mother's ex-husband uh, every day. But then to go through the secondary experience of abandonment, looking back, was when my brother Nico was born. And why I felt abandonment, because I seen the difference of love. I seen the difference of what it looked like. The difference of who he was with the child that was actually his, his blood. Yeah. yeah. And I could feel the difference. I, could, sure. I witnessed it. And because of those emotions, I started to act out. Looking back now, it's easy because I wanted attention. I wanted attention back from me. I wanted, I wanted, and I didn't know how to ask, like, okay, why... Why, when I was my brother's age, why was my discipline so strong and I had to do X, Y, and Z, and if I didn't make my bed correctly, he would mess up the rest of my room and make me clean it all from top to bottom, and my punishments were like severe, and then I look at my, now, now I have two brothers at this point, their upbringing is way different. There's a lot more like gentleness and loving and kind, it's a, it's a different, and so I saw a different side of my stepfather that I hadn't experienced. So then that created this emotion in me. And again, not knowing how to deal with it, I sought out relief. Yeah. And so I can only, I look back now and see that, but in that, in those moments, then I had no idea that that's what was going on. Yeah. I had no ways to articulate that to my mother. The way I showed that I was in pain was by being a jerk, by doing the things that that I was doing, by getting in trouble at school. Cause at least at that point, they sat me down at the table and I got all the attention. You know, that night, it's about me, even though it's not good, what it, why it's about me isn't good, but still at that point, it was about me. Yeah. So. So that external validation, even if it was negative, it was validation. Yes. Of some sort. Mm -hmm. And the drugs help so that to, 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 to quiet it all down, to quiet it all down, to remove me, even like the, um, it's, it's the, if it can take me out of myself and the reality of what I'm experiencing, I'll use it and, and, and I'll abuse it. And that's even true to, to this day still without, it doesn't need to be a drug necessarily. Okay. It just needs to be something that can take me out of myself. I have the capabilities to, to use and abuse anything until it no longer works for me. If I don't have the information to know that that's actually what's happening with me, right? If I don't have the full understanding of how this, this thing that I suffer from operates within me internally. That's why I couldn't get clean and stay clean when I initially first started trying for all those years. The yeah. information wasn't correct yeah. that I had. So you heard from J is it Jimmy? Is yes. Jimmy? Okay. So Jimmy. Jimmy's telling you something different than what you'd heard in the past. And it triggered something inside of me. Yeah. It triggered something inside of me and it was the first experience that I... I wanted what he was, whatever that is. I didn't even know what it was. Like, I just was like, how, how do I have that? How do I get that? Because 
I, now I can identify with that. I can identify with those internal struggles. I can identify with the validation. I can identify with the emotions behind all this. I can identify with falling short constantly and letting my family, all that stuff that he was talking about, I instantly connected with. And it was the first time that I had that connection. And it was the first time that I didn't feel uniquely screwed up because someone was talking about it. And for me, that was a turning point for me because I had always classified myself as unique, as uniquely messed up in my own way. Therefore, that kept me in silence because no one could fully understand the depths of what I suffer, all this stuff that kept me quiet and locked up within myself. So, okay. So Jimmy triggered, Jimmy yeah. triggered that inside of me that gave that gauged interest now. Okay. And it wasn't like I was then clean from that moment on, but it gauged interest and it started to get me to to kind of peek over what is this all about what what do i suffer from what is what is the disease of addiction like so how so how does i said to ask questions so and, and i wasn't as as resistant as i once was so what was the process you were in a you were in a a, a center you heard jimmy speak mm -hmm. then what happened what how did what was the did you you left eventually left there yep where did you find help that that helped you get to where you are. So from that point on, I went to a program after that. Like I said, it gauged interest. Uh, it, it made me less resistance, but there was still a resistance in me. I went to a facility and, and I made a commitment to myself, like, oh, I'm gonna do, I'm going to do what's asked of me. I'm not going to be resistant. So uh, I allowed them to pick and choose uh, where they were, cause I would always manipulate the situation. I wanted to go to the easier program with the quickest with the least amount of waiting time to get to the program. I wanted to go to the place that'll let me drop my bags and leave and then come back later. I, I was always trying to manipulate the situation to work in my best interest of what I thought was my best interest. And, uh, and so I, I went to a program, I, I took all the suggestions and they told me to go to meetings. I went to meetings. They told me to get a sponsor, I got a sponsor, and they told me to, to do service, they, they told me to wake up, they, everything that they were telling me to do, I did, and, 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 and my life began to get better. My life around me began to get better. Were, was this like an inpatient facility? Were you yeah, it was a halfway house, so it was a six month program that I had went to, and I did everything that they told me to do, and I stayed clean. And that was my first experience with, with surrender. I surrendered on, on a, a basic level, like a very basic level. Just, I, I did what was told on the most basic level, which was like, this is your curfew, come home. This is when you wake up. This is when you go to bed. This is your chore. You have to go to these meetings. You have to get a job. You have to pay rent. Um, you have to do all these things. And I did well. I did well doing that externally. Like my life externally was, was getting better which this was the beginning point of, of everything. So that kept me away from the drugs for a long enough period of time where my, the, the transition, the, the shift occurred, right? Mm -hmm. That's, that's what I call it. And that's like pretty much what I based a lot of like when I, when I talk to like guys that I sponsor or why it is that we have to have an understanding of the disease of addiction, like how, how it operates within us. Right. Cause we get this confusion that we think that the disease of addiction is centered around drugs and alcohol, drugs and or alcohol, but it's so much deeper than that. That's just a, a consequence of suffering from what we suffer from. So if that's the case and it's not about drugs and alcohol, then my disease can still be active within me internally, even being away from the drugs and al alcohol for a long length of time, if I don't address it. Now, I never had the full understanding of what it was, so therefore I could never address it properly, right? So for, from that, ha ha uh, that halfway house, to up to around three and a half years clean, four years clean, I stayed clean. But I didn't stay clean because I had like surrendered to a true process of growth and change. I stayed clean because of the, this is what I call it. This is the best I can explain it. So we have a disease internally that can manifest itself in any and all areas of our life. Like I told you, I don't, I can take anything in my life and just, and if it makes me feel good, I'll use it. And I can get very distracted and go on what we call a run. The same way I would chase heroin, I can chase anything if it makes me feel good. So from the halfway house, you brought in this young boy with no self-esteem that had never really acquired anything of value in life to, hey, I'm clean and now I want stuff, right? 
So I want things. And in order for me to, to, to get the things that I want, there were certain things that I, I needed to do. So I'm 21 years old at the time. So I became super obsessed on, obviously I want, I wanted girls to be attracted to me, but in order for girls to be attracted to me, I had to have a car in order for me to have a car, I had to get a license. And so like, uh, I, I began a process of what, what I call my disease, putting stipulations upon my happiness and sending me on this endless chase to nothing. Right. So it said, when you arrive at this certain point, essentially everything that you've always been looking for and that freedom that you've been looking for will be there. And so I took the bait over and over and over again. It started with, we just got to graduate this program and get a job and get our own apartment. And I said, okay. And so I graduated the program and I got an apartment and then, then it was like, oh, we need a vehicle, dude. And I was like, okay. We got to get a vehicle. And so I had to get my license back and then buy a car. And then I bought, got my license back and I had a car and it was like, oh man, we're, we're too skinny. We need to get in shape. We need to get in shape now. And I'm like, okay. And so like, I get really obsessive on the gym and I'm focused on like my body and supplements. And at that time I started taking steroids and all to create this, this, this perception. And then now I have the muscles and I have, I have a car and I have, the apartment is like, now we need a girlfriend. We need a really, and I'm like, okay. And so now I'm chasing after the girl and then, and it was like a never ending cycle. And so it was under the promise too. And this is, this is the, the, the saddest part about it is it was under the promise, the false promise that when I arrived at whatever point it was that it was sending me, that it, the freedom that I had always sought after would be there waiting for me. And I'd be able to <gasps> finally breathe. And I wouldn't be suffering from all these things that I'd been suffering from my whole life. And it was it, it, it was a bar that every time you reached it was set higher and it was an endless chase of something. And then finally I find myself with four years clean with all the stuff that my disease had promised me. If you just get this, you'll be happy. And I had, I, I was in shape and, and I had an apartment and I had a roommate and I had a car and I had my license and, and I, and, and my family was proud of me. And, and I had all this validation from all these people telling me you're doing good. Cause externally it looked like it. Right. And, and I had a, 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 a girl and I had endless amounts of clothes and sneakers. I mean, endless, like just cause I needed all of it, all every bit of it. I needed all of it. And, and I had all this stuff. And I remember sitting in my bed and I was the most depressed and the most miserable that I had ever been. I'm even talking you were using, even when I was using, Wow. because at least when I was using, I could kind of directly correlate the negative emotions that I was experiencing oh, okay. to the fact that I was shooting heroin. Yeah. I could go, okay, there was some relief. And in, in, in those moments when I tell myself I'm going to stop tomorrow, if I stop tomorrow, things will get better and I'll feel better. And there was that small sense of like, yeah, you're right. It will be better. And then I'd continue doing But in this, I had nothing to, I had nothing to blame all these negative. I still suffered from severe fears, doubts, and insecurities. I still required so much validation. I still had severe vanity issues. I still had terror to, to take necessary steps in my life to truly progress. I worked a job that I hated. I had friendships that I didn't create boundaries in. I didn't know who I was. I put on a show for everybody that I was around because I was, I was, I was a prisoner to the perception of me, right? Not who I actually was in the moment. It was who I wanted to be perceived as. And different groups required me to be perceived as different things. So I, I was never consistent. It was exhausting. I had to change be, yourself. I had to change myself constantly. Wow. And, uh, that would be exhausting. <laughs> oh, what was it ever? And I was lost and I was scared and I was still a little boy. And that was the truth of it. And I didn't know how to ask for help because I had to live up to the hype of myself that I was trying to build up for everybody else around me. So how, who I really was and how I really felt didn't match up to the life that I had built and the perception that I was trying to be perceived at, yeah. essentially. But you were going to treatment at, or, or no, where had you stopped? I, I'd still go to meetings. So that wasn't enough to... Mm -mm. Nope. So I, I, when I was reading your bio, you said uh, around this point, you, you, you said, um, it was a very crucial point for me. I was teetering, asking, do I even want to stay clean anymore? Mm -hmm. So was that, what was that like, thinking about that? I mean, you'd been successful, and, and it was that bad that you were like, maybe I'll just start using it again. Yeah, because I didn't, I didn't understand that the freedom that I was looking for what wasn't an external freedom. I always thought that it was freedom from my probation officer, freedom from financial struggle, freedom from having to take the bus. And I always thought that it was like these external, the freedom that I was always looking for was internal yeah. freedom from self. I had been caged and locked up 
by myself in my own head. I call it mental imprisonment, an internal prison. Like I, I never adopted the trait of what I, like for me, my belief system now, when I, when I talk to anybody, when they say, what is the most important thing? And I said, my two, the two most important things for me, even before 12 step recovery or before whatever, because I believe in all pathways, but none of them work. If you don't develop the ability to, to tell the truth, which is honesty and relentless communication, it begins and ends with those two things. And if you think of any pathway towards recovery in any form, whether it's 12 step, whether it's um, church, whether it's just therapy, whether it's intense therapy, wh whatever, if you're not, if you don't have the ability to tell the truth and if you don't have the ability to, uh, to communicate, not, nothing will work. There's no treatment for what is not known, right? I believe honesty is the number one antidote to the disease of addiction. I believe that wholeheartedly. And it's only through honesty can we be accountable. It's only through accountability can we change. And people are so, t I was so terrified of that because I classified myself as unique, right? Okay. Right. So, but you so, said you'd started to discover you weren't unique at that, at that when Jimmy talked. Yeah. But that was still a, a problem for you. Oh, absolutely. Because it, there was so much. So I had acquired so much internally. I didn't even know where to begin. Right. And then I felt like there was a sense of responsibility. Like if all of a sudden I, I said my truth out loud that I would have to change everything immediately and never fall short again. So the, the exposure component for me was, was still tough. Like to, to be in a place of complete exposure. This is, this is who I am currently. This is what I'm feeling currently. Yeah. And, uh, and not a, and also not confusing it just, just because this is where I'm at in this present moment doesn't mean that this is who I am, right? Like I'm allowed to, to freely be whatever I am in the current moment and not have that, not have uh, the, the fear of like, okay, if, if I let you know that this is what I'm struggling with, uh, am I then classified as this must be who I am because I'm selfish today? Am I a selfish person forever? Or because I'm, I'm not empathetic towards anybody's feelings today? I'm, I'm in a, where, does that mean I'm just a, a, a heartless person? And just, I would confuse that. If I expose that, then that was what obviously I am if I say it out loud and that's now what your perception of me is going to be. But it was hard for me to get to that point where I was willing to expose myself, like what was actually happening internally. And so, yes, when I got to that point, it was the worst pain because not only had I had gone so deep internally, but I had, I had put on this show for so long. How, how do I tell people where I'm at? How, cause I've painted this picture for so long. Now, how do I tell you who I really am and how I really feel, you know? Cause it wouldn't, it, it was so far from aligning with what I was trying to sell everybody. Right. So it'd be even more confusing, especially cause the validation of my mother, she's so proud of me. Yeah. Everybody's so proud of me. You don't want to lose that. No, you're doing so good. Yeah. That's the, you're doing, keep it up. Yeah. And little did they know it was like, I, I wasn't, I, I hadn't changed anything. I hadn't changed anything. That scared little boy that started at 17 hadn't done nothing to heal or acknowledge or commute anything that, that he had ever, he was just now thrown out into society and trying to figure it all out, all while balancing all this inner turmoil and crazy thoughts and just, it was exhausting. So what was it that changed? When, when, when did that change? When did you move to the next stage of your recovery? So around four years clean, my stepfather, uh, so it's, it's crazy because the, the gifts of recovery happen in spite of like how just uh, inevitably we stop just using drugs and, and all that stuff. And, and we live clean and abstinent life gets, life gets better in spite of how we're doing internally. One of the benefits of me not using in that four, four year period, um, was my relationship with my stepfather. Um, I developed this beautiful relationship with them and, uh, and he would call me and like my resentments and all the stuff that I had, I had come to a place where I, I kind of, I didn't feel any of that anger towards him. A, a lot of my being able to look back at that point, my acting out and just looking at it from his perspective, you know, like he stuck by me regardless and, and he did the best that he could. And, and I was a jerk as a child too, you know, we didn't speak for years. 
for years when I was using like almost a two and a half year period, we didn't speak a word to each other. And him and my mother almost got a divorce over me because she was enabling me so bad. So when I finally got clean, we began a slow process and then we became super close. And then he was like confiding in me and st with stuff and he was trusting in me and with different things. And um, my brothers, he would ask me for it. It was just that I had an awesome relationship with them that I was super grateful for. So he got sick when I, when I had about four years clean and, and it was out of nowhere. And, um, my mother called me and told me that he was driving home and his face started to droop a little bit and he was looking in the mirror and he didn't know what it was. And so he went to the hospital and they're keeping him overnight to do some tests. And she was super scared. And my mother is like, Oh, like talk about faith. Like, uh, that woman's a saint. And she, if you ever heard her backstory of her life and what she does for a living, it's, I definitely get what I do from my mother. Yeah. Um, and to hear the fear in her voice, like I knew something was wrong. So they, they do all these tests. They can't figure out what it is. And over like a one week span, cause they sent them home and then he was experiencing like headaches and all that stuff. And they came back and they had to, that they, they, they did like a, a, a certain type of scan and they could see like shadows in the scan of his brain, but they weren't completely sure. They knew they had to do a brain biopsy if they were to be completely sure of like what was happening. And um, so they, January 29th, um, which is also my birthday, they did a brain biopsy on him and uh, they found out that his brain was covered in legions, cancer, and um, he had brain cancer, severe. And he probably had about four months to live, which out of nowhere. The crazy part is, is so that night I went to the hospital. I was with my two younger brothers and we were joking around. My two younger brothers are hilarious. They're just great kids and never struggled with substance use. No. And we were in the hospital room and, and my brother Trey makes my, makes my father laugh so hard. Like he just has this... He can, even from a young age, like he could, he could talk trash to my dad when he was getting yelled at and my, it would tickle my, my father was like so serious. You know what I mean? Like Italian, old school, like people were afraid of him. He didn't speak much. And like Trey would just be like, nah, yell at him. And, and he would get a kick out of it. Cause he's not, no one talked to him like that. So we were at the hospital and Trey, we're all making him laugh and all this. And he had to get, he had to go to bed cause he was doing the brain biopsy that night. And so we were all leaving and we all stayed. Oh, bye. My brother Nico said, bye. I love you. Stuff like that. And Trey said the same thing. Bye. I love you. And, and then I went up. I shook his hands, gave him a hug. And I said, all right, bye. I love you. When I went to pull my hand away, he squeezed. And, uh, and, and he pulled me in and he said, he said, you know, I love you, right? And I was like, I was like, yeah, of course. I was like, of course that I know that. And he pulled me in again. He was like, no, you know that I, that I love you. Right. And, uh, I was like, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then he hugged me tight and he was like, all right. And, and that was the last thing that he ever said to me. Cause that night he went in for the biopsy and, uh, they told him he had four months to live. And they, after that, he went back to sleep and it was like, he just was like, I'm not doing, I'm not doing that. And he just let go. Crazy part to that was that I didn't know. I had that, you know, that like internal struggle, like from a young kid, like he loves them. He must, I, I confused that from like a, like the stuff that I carried with me. And, uh, and he said that to me in that moment. And it's like, he almost, he knew, he knew I needed that. Right. Like almost required it. And, uh, had he never said that to you before? Not like that. Okay. Different way of saying it. Yeah, I love you, Dad. I love you, too. Okay. This was like a, I felt like, like he needed me to know for sure. Like he needed me to know that it was, it was, it was no different the way, because he didn't say that to my brothers, you know, like, obviously they, they know, they knew he loved them. They didn't, they didn't struggle with that internally. He knew that I must have struggled with that internally. And I, he knew that I needed that. And uh, 
that was the last thing that he ever said to me. And um, so there I was, right? He passed away. And the, the next day, everything slipped upside down my life. And uh, now, now, mind you, I've been living to this perception. And I, there's assumptions from everybody around me that Chris got four years. He must be doing all this. And uh, now my mother, is, who's the source of all strength, is just broken. And then there's my brothers, who are babies at the time, like 15 years old and 17 years old or whatever it was. And they're broken. And, and my sister, who had her own struggles. And, uh, and then here I am, like... Just like I, I wanted, I, I just come from that place, like I told you about, like wanting to, struggling with the idea of using, and then my my father passing away and everything being upside down. And um, the only thing that kept me clean in that moment is I was not going to let my mother lose her husband and her son in one whack. And so... But you were thinking about it. Oh, I was thinking about it, yeah. Two days later... It was a Wednesday, I believe. I know it was a Wednesday. I don't know if it was two days later, but I, I, I remember calling on my mom, checking on her, and like being strong. And I remember hanging up the phone and just sobbing, crying, and just in this place of desperation. And a gentleman came by the house. He was actually friends with one of my friends, and I couldn't stand this guy. I, this is Joe? Joe, yeah. Okay. I could not stand him. And um, <laughs> Why couldn't you stand him? Because he, he, he had freedom to be himself. He, and, and I didn't even know that that's essentially why I couldn't stand him. But he, he, he was brave to me. Brave in the way that he could raise his hand in a meeting and share honesty. Brave in the way that he could stand up in front of the room and crack jokes. And not be afraid. Like not overanalyze every thought. Like is this going to be funny? Should I say this? How should I say this? How will it? Like that was like what mine was, my mind was like. You know? And, and uh, he was beloved by many people he had all these friends he had a sponsor like he was invested in this and so i hated him but i was just jealous and envious of him it wasn't an actual hatred but it came out like that because he was a reminder to me constantly of what i was not yeah. you know and so that's what created that inner turmoil that's why i was like i don't like that guy <laughs> don't bring him around and uh but so he came so to my he was house. Around. <laughs> he was around. He was around by default. And he knew I didn't like him too, which was crazy <laughs> that this moment, which was such an integral part in everything for me. And um, he walked in. My buddy Keith was with him. They were about to go to the gym. And Keith went upstairs. And Joe was just kind of like awkwardly standing in the living room. He saw me crying. And he just like didn't kind of know what to do. And like, and he walked in the kitchen. And um, he asked me, he was like, hey, are you all right? And, uh, and I was just crying. I didn't respond. And uh, he was like, why don't you come to the men's meeting tonight? He was like, there's a, there's a meeting tonight that I go to. He was like, you, you should come to this men's meeting. And uh, everything inside of me was like, no, 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 absolutely not. Get this guy out of here. Like my internal dialogue was just like, ah. And then I opened up my mouth and I was like, okay. <laughs> and I don't know where that came from. I have no idea where that came from. And yeah. Five hours later, I found myself in a men's meeting. And at that men's meeting, my pain was so strong internally. I had been living this, this lie for so long and just like the, the putting on the show and dancing for all these people and not dancing in like the professionals. I'm like, when I say dancing for people, I mean like a, a performance, a perform like giving them what, what I think that they want out of me. Right. Yeah. So yeah. the chameleon component and, uh, and I raised my hand at that meeting and for the first time ever, I completely exposed myself through, through dialogue. I let people know exactly where I was at, exactly who I'd been for four years, exactly what I was struggling with, exactly the type of life and unspiritual things and the way that I lie and the way that uh, I manipulate people and the way that uh, how I was taking steroids because that was a big secret and I would deny it to everybody that was asking me. And like, not only was I taking them, I was selling them and and, and, and I had gotten robbed selling them. All, all this insanity of my life without using drugs and like who I like, because in the meetings, like I would pr I would raise my hand every now and then I'd say something profound that I read in the literature that I didn't even live by, I believe, oh, just because okay. I wanted people to think I was smart, right? Or I wanted the, uh -huh. the I wanted validation, right? I wanted the girls to be like, oh, he's awesome. And the guys <laughs> to be like, oh, he's cool. Yeah. And um, full exposure. And I held that meeting hostage for about, 
25 minutes and I just unleashed everything. And uh, this is exactly who I am. And I was freely being myself for the first time. And I, I don't even know in a long time. And, and I, I got the first exposure of what that freedom was that I was actually looking for all those years. And, uh, and my, the reaction that I had always assumed that would happen, had, it, had I ever done that, it wasn't what I, nobody stormed out. Nobody was like, oh, not only that, but after that meeting, I connected with more people at a meeting than I had ever connected with before yeah. from like a sense of like guys coming up to me to support me and love me up. And then guys like, hey, can I talk to you? You know, that thing that you were talking about? Oh, I struggle with that too. That's really been, and it was like, I opened up all these conversations with so many, I had connected with more people than I had ever thought. And it was the turning point of everything. That night at that meeting, there was another gentleman that was there that heard me speak. He had just lost a friend of his, um, one of his best friends, like four months prior. And, and so he heard me speak about the loss of my father and all the stuff that I was going through. And uh, he invited me to a meeting that was uh, a couple days later that he was speaking at. That gentleman ended up speaking about, he had a similar message to the guy, Jimmy, that had spoke five years prior. And he was talking about all this stuff, but then he was talking about how he got to that place through step work and through honesty and communication and um, all this stuff. And, and, uh, and, and I was like ready to hear, right? I, I, I was finally in a place where I was like, whatever this guy is selling, I'm buying. I asked him to be my sponsor and he taught me about recovery. He taught me about the disease of addiction and um, he showed me a pathway to the solution that I'd been looking for. And, uh, and, and then everything changed. But, but you had been in a 12 step program at mm -hmm. that point. Yep. So everything, but, but you had been kind of, you hadn't really allowed it in or allowed it to work on you up to that point. Just like, yeah, like I said in the beginning, honesty and relentless communication, nothing <laughs> works, right? So you were just kind of faking it a little too, maybe too strong or? or? Oh, I was fully faking. You were fully, okay. I was fully faking. There was, there was never any full, complete uh, exposure of anything that, that was truly going on with me. My And that's necessary for a 12 step to work. Oh, 100%. Can you talk, so just kind of to put a pause in your personal story for a second, talk about what that, I mean, most people kind of have an idea of what the 12 step, a 12 step program is. I mean, we've all seen it either acted out or dramatized or, or, yeah. or, or, or satirized, you know, on TV, but what's it, what, what is it, what is, what is it and how does it really work? So there's two components. So there's the, the, the recovery meetings and then there's the actual 12 steps that you write and, um, so which which work in conjunction with one another they, they 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 both need to be there and a lot of people will do one without the other and vice versa and um and and i believe in in both so the 12 steps uh, the way that i explain it to people it's the beginning process of like what we talked about with the honesty but it's a complete self-analysis right it's a complete all this stuff that burdened us because the disease, how it operates within us, it stems through thought form, right? It's classified as a brain disorder. And without the acknowledge, without the information of like how the disease of addiction operates within us, we're kind of lost on an island by ourselves, trying to sort through our own clutter to get to our own clarity, right? And what we'll do as addicts is we'll attach a lot of truth to thought. And uh, the way that it operates is like, my story is telling me my, my disease, which is in thought form is so, Basically, the 12 steps um, are uh, uh, in-depth self-analysis slash self-discovery um, slash the beginning of that process of, of uh, learning to acquire one of the most important skills, which is to tell your truth, your honesty, and, and, to, and to deal with self, right? All that stuff internally that I had carried for, for so long that I was terrified about um, to, to, to bring it to the forefront and deal with it. So initially what the, the first step is essentially teaching us what it is about us that we can't use in moderation, right? What, how our disease uh, operates with us internally and why is it that we can't just, like people my whole life be like, why don't you just stop? Trust me, if it was that easy, like I would rather choose like, hey, I'm going to stop rather than like being homeless and robbing people. Like <laughs> right. I'd much rather be in college with my friends or work in a great full-time job and not be like dirty on the streets sharing needles. But so if that's the case, if I can't stop on my own, like, like, why is it that 
Bob, my neighbor, could get up every day, go to work with no struggles, come home from work, have a glass of wine, one glass of wine, go to bed and get up the next day and do that. And like, I would try to work a job and while using and halfway to the job, I decide that yeah, screw it, I'm going to go do drugs instead, right? Like, why is that dialogue in me? and not in him. So I had to learn about what it was that I suffered from and the extent that I suffered and how it operated within me, which is the first step, which was valuable information for me because uh, I started to make sense. Okay, I have an idea of how this thing's constantly working in me and how it affects me. Even with, so when the drugs are no longer in, in the picture, how is it that I can continue to create unmanageability in my life? And how is it that I still seek out relief and, and all that? So to understand like what that is that gets me to go to that point. And uh, so first step is to understand what it is, right? Because we need to have a full idea and understand to the depths to which it, it, it affects us to completely understand what's necessary now for us to to implement, to change, right? We need to be fully diagnosed. We don't go to the doctor and the doctor goes, man, I don't know. It's kind of, it may be, no, the doctor has to get a full analysis of what's going on with you so he can diagnose it and then treat it. He doesn't kind of get a, a half a picture of what it is and then just assume something and start throwing guesses out there to, to fix it. I mean, a second and third is that we're, we're powerless. We're powerless in the, in the aspect like that we can't do this alone, right? That I don't have the power and the ability to fix me by myself. I will never possess the skill to sort through my own clutter to get to my own clarity. I require someone else and to, to be able to turn my the, the care of my life over. I mean, a higher power, God, whatever. People struggle with that concept. It's just, it's just turning it over to something other than you, right? Just it's that acknowledgement that I can't in, in, in the secondary is that you'll let someone or something else, right? Whether you believe in God, whether you believe in the universe, whether you believe in just people as a whole, it could just be other addicts or whatever it is. It's just a necessary like to swallow down that I don't have the capabilities to do this by myself. And even in all pathways to recovery, when I explain to people, because if they don't choose 12 step fellowship, I don't mind. I think you can get clean wherever you go. You just have to make that, you have to swallow down that you alone can't, right? So find your someone or something that's going to be in a place of guidance that'll, that'll help to implement the structure and what's necessary and required for you to have sustainable long-term recovery. And then the fourth step is essentially, I explain it as that machine that you hook up to a car that they plug into the car and it, it diagnoses, does, it runs diagnostics and it gives you a long laundry list of like everything that's messed up with the car. It doesn't necessarily fix the car but it gives you a real good idea of what's wrong with it and uh and that's that's truly the the, the meat and potatoes of once you're in a four step i mean you, it's like a, a true a final acknowledgement of like all the pain and suffering that you've caused or that you've experienced and and patterns of behaviors and resentments that you may have carried and just everything just bringing it all to the surface and looking at it because we we, we have these tendencies where we're so unwilling to, to, to look at the stuff. So we try to suppress it and we don't realize that through that suppression, we're just, the disease is weaponizing our innermost to use against us, right? My biggest way to explain it to, to like addicts around here, like when we don't deal with that stuff, our disease uses it. It weaponizes specifically my innermost, right? Vulnerabilities, insecurities, regrets, remorse, um, or all that stuff, it, it uses mine against me, right? So even when I'm beginning to have a good day and maybe I'm feeling good physically and I'm like, today's gonna be a good day and I'm in my car and I'm driving and then I have this random thought that occurs and it's like, oh, remember this terrible, awful thing that you did two years ago? Or it's like, oh, your father never loved you. Just a random thought out of nowhere that we don't decide to have those thoughts. But for me, those are like untreated things and stuff that I'm not willing to acknowledge about myself or maybe express through dialogue, like that truth, those fears that my disease will weaponize and use against me randomly to pull me out of the moment, right? And to project me somewhere else, whether it's in the past with regret and remorse or it's in the future with anxiety and fear and how can I? And, and so working a four step and just bringing that all to the light and then sharing it with somebody else, right? Which is the scariest part, mm -hmm. sharing it. The last question on a fourth step is like, is there anything that you left out that you aren't willing to tell another human <laughs> being?
That's the last question. It's and you're supposed to tell another human being whatever it is. Yep. <laughs> yep. And there was stuff, and it's funny because, I mean, essentially when you're doing it, you, you, it's it's the it's your autobiography, right? So if you're lying in it, you're only lying to yourself, and people get nervous through uh, complete exposure of of stuff that we've classified as too sick or too regretful or oh if they that that we can talk about this but that we take to the grave right which isolates us puts us back in that unique category i remember being in that place where i wrote my whole full step and then it asked me that question and then it was immediate it's like boom right to the forefront right when i is there anything that you left out and i was like shoot it came right to the the forefront of my mind of course and uh and then there was that internal struggle like, uh, I can't write that. I can't talk about that. I can't write that. And um, I remember writing it. And then I was supposed to go over it with uh, my sponsor. And I procrastinated it for months and months. And I played out this, these different ways of how it would go. And if he looks at me a certain way or if he gets disgusted. Uh, like, fear, right? It was the fear surfacing. And uh, again, my head telling me, you can't, you can't, you can't talk about this. You can't. And me having the ability and the experience and the, had an experience the freedom from like that moment when I raised my hand in the men's meeting and, it, and that exposure and what that did for me and the connection that came from that and where that led me to that moment now where I'm, I'm, I'm writing that. And I remember where I was sharing, reading through my whole full step and then that question and then me walking through that fear and sharing it with another human being. And uh, I remember not only did he not look at me weird and did he not judge me, but he had similar experience and, and empathy and had gone through um, something almost exactly the same. And it was like that, that ball of just that tight, that I carried in me internally for all those years, right? Like no matter how good I was doing in life, I had like this, this ball of secrecy that I had carried of like things that I had done or things that I was ashamed of or, and I felt the, the freedom from it for the first time. And, uh, and that again, that was another turning point and another change. Cause in that moment I was like, I want other people to feel that. Like everything that I built that up, that moment to be like, and why I could never have that moment, uh, was it, it was nothing like how it actually went, right? And it was actually providing essentially the freedom that I was always looking for. And I started to develop clarity internally. I wasn't prisoner to self. And now all of a sudden things were opening up for me, right? There's, I don't have this relentless experience of thought negative thought based off of secrecy internal insecurities all this stuff because i'm dealing with it i'm talking about it i'm walking through fears i'm allowing myself to be right and one of my favorite sayings is we're never obligated to be anything other than what we actually are in this moment regardless of what it looks like it's our truth it's called living within our truth and the only way we get through whatever we're going through is to actually live within our truth so if my truth in this moment is I'm exhausted because I'm a new dad and I'm insecure that maybe I'm not doing enough. I should help her, my wife out more. And, but maybe I don't want to say that out loud because I don't want other people to judge me and to have you have a person. Chris isn't a good dad or he doesn't help out his. So we get trapped in that. And so my freedom comes with like saying that stuff out loud and, and, and then the action comes after, right? So I have to identify what, what, what the internal struggle is through communication and, and then the action component happens after. So working through the fourth step. Um, so 12 step recovery is essentially what we do is we go through that. Um, then obviously from the fourth step leads to our fifth and sixth. And that's a, a list of defects of character. We can clearly see these deficiencies in our lives, these patterns of behaviors. It's the uh, self discovery. It's like, how do we want to, how are we currently living and how would we like to live and what does it take to get there? Right. And then as you travel through the steps, um, 11th is going on a spiritual journey, trying to seek out more, um, information and knowledge outside the realm of just the 12 step the 12 steps and then the 12th step is essentially like now help someone else right now give back what was given to you and it's just like this continuous cycle and 
you're never really done. You start back at one, but the story is different each time you go through it, right? And it's and it's and it's kind of gauging and watching how the miracle of recovery has been taking place in your life, right? I go back and read Stepwork that I wrote eight years ago. I'm like, whoa, you know. But it 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 validates that that it is working in our lives. That change is occurring. So you're right? actually writing this down as a record. And you keep yours. Oh, I keep do, mine. Do, do, is that a thing that people are supposed to do when they go through? This? It's up to them. Some people yeah. can burn it if they want to. I like reference points. I like yeah. to see. You can see growth. Yeah. I love to see the, the growth component. But the 12, the 12 steps to me is the foundation from which I build upon. But then I take it. I, liked, I add other elements because I don't believe in just one thing, right? I believe. once. So once I started to learn about the disease uh, operating and stemming through thought, it became, made me fascinated in the mind, how the mind works, the subconscious mind. So I started to become a student of the mind, which led me down a path of the power of affirmations, like the law of attraction, the power of intentional thinking, and then which led me down um, multiple paths that I implement all in conjunction with this that really creates different layers to, to, to everything. That's why I'm so bold with business. Um, and it's why I'm so, my philosophies is obviously changing in the, the, the like the, the belief system, like what we, cause especially as addicts, like I work in conjunction with the, with 12 step recovery, but also I, it's about a day clean necessary, but then I also love screaming at people's spirit, right? To get them into the, the mindset and the belief of like possibilities, right? Even if they can't think in the possibilities of anything, they just have to think in the possibilities of maybe something. And just speaking to that part of the human being that tends to be killed off when we're abusing drugs and when we're just coming from like the depths of hell and whatever lives we were living. And um, to get them to start to get their mind to work in terms of that, right? Like to, to start to get them in the belief that we can start to develop a life worth living. And if they don't understand how to, to necessarily... Sh my thing is we don't ever have to understand the how. Let's identify the what, the how will work itself out, right? And that's literally been... And then I have my own story to reflect on. Like how all this stuff came into fruition. How all these businesses came into fruition. They didn't, I, didn't come, I didn't graduate college and... and and have a master's in business and, and just start doing, applying all the knowledge that I had. I just identified what, and I communicated constantly what, what I wanted for my life and, and the how the universe and everything else around me started to work it out for me. So all this broke through kind of at that point after your stepfather had passed away. Yes. You had gone through those 12 steps, I assume, before, but you hadn't actually... Completely. I had never gone through the 12 steps before. I would oh. start them and stop them. Okay. So you've never done that for... I, I was wondering if maybe you had done four, but you hadn't really done it or something. I hadn't even done it all. I wouldn't. I would, you, I would never commit to it completely. I was too sidetracked. I, was, I had bought into the, the, the lie so deep that these other things were going to be what was going to be my freedom. I, I was... It, it, like when I tell you my disease like had me... Like the same, it was like the same way it had me when I was using drugs, right? Like the objective was to get high and my everyday was around getting high. It had me in like the fulfillment of external accomplishments. Like when it was like, Chris, this is what we need to do and we got to get it. That I was just locked into that. And it was, I wasn't really messing with anything that was going to distract me from, from those things, right? So it was the, ex I went on a run using with external, um, uh, accumulations right so car apartment all that stuff okay yeah so so that that was more that was feeding the same part of your soul that that the, the drugs, drugs did absolutely because okay. it was Different providing that that short-term stimulation every it was the the reward it was hitting the reward receptor um yeah. so i would but it was it was just like the drugs it would it would wear out instantly the second i acquired what i what i was like so oh this is gonna be it i'm finally gonna be happy and then it was like that moment and then it was like it's gone so there was there was no sustainable freedom it was just like with the drugs it was like all this work to get high and then all this and then you're high and then it's like boom you fall asleep and boom you're miserable again
and it's like start all over and you have to chasing something or someone constantly a chase there was never any ability to sit with self there's allowing yourself to be hell no that's the last thing i was trying to do i had to be stimulated from something in order to get myself to continue moving forward so when did you uh so i part of your part of your um bio talks about at some point in your recovery you started you became a professional dancer Mm -hmm. tell me a little bit about that because i'm curious because that leads into the that leads into i want to ask you about your entrepreneurship you had kind of mentioned that you've done a lot of business so how did you become a professional dancer it's how does that happen in somebody's life it's funny when you when when you awake the spirit that's why i talk about like yelling at the spirit when you start to get some an addict especially an addict like me to start to believe in the possibility of something then for brief moments the dialogue mentally would start to change and maybe for a brief moment uh i would have this belief like oh i could probably dance and and it just takes me saying that out loud once to engage in a dialogue with someone else like you should do that well you, you could do it or, or whatever it is and uh at the con at that time with that sponsor i was working a job in the roofers union i hated it every day um it's hard work Oh yeah, <laughs> and 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 I'm a I'm I'm not like a man's man. I'm the furthest thing from a man's man. I'm like the opposite of that. I was I'm like scared of bugs, spiders. I don't like the feeling of dirt on my. F I'm the opposite, but I did it because that's what I thought that because of the felonies and all this stuff. I was like, well, what can you do? What can I do? This is gonna be it's it, tough. right? Yeah. Yeah. So. I didn't have, I had no idea that I could create my own path. If there wasn't paths being provided for me, it was like, go out and forge your own, like find what you're passionate about. And I didn't know that that was possible at that point. I remember being on the roof every day. And obviously at this point, like I'm doing step work and all this stuff and I'm, I'm generating a new belief system. And I'm not even sure I, I, I even have the awareness to know that it's happening. I remember being on the roof in uh I had a roommate at the time and we both worked together. We drove together and all this stuff. And we actually shared an apartment and uh, I remember being up there and I was like, I'm not doing this no more. He was like, what? He's like, I'm quitting today. He's like, you can't quit. I'm like, nah, I'm quitting. He's like, what are you going to do? And I remember talking to my, uh, my sponsor and some other people. I was like, I think I want to try to be a dancer. And uh, I was like, I want to dance. He said, like, don't shut up, dude. <laughs> I'm like, no, nah, I'm dead serious. I want to be a dancer. And uh, I had had a little bit of experience with it when I was like 18. I had dabbled. There was this group that did it in Boston. And, and uh, I had like a brief for like four or five months. I worked with them, but I was using. And uh, it didn't work, obviously. I was strung out on drugs trying to, but I saw it. I, and, and it was embedded in my mind. And now this is fast forward years, years later. Yeah. This is, you know, you're going to be 24, 25, yep, you're yep, talking about? Yeah, almost seven years later, yeah. yeah. And um, I went back to that same place. So I quit the roofers union. They had like an intervention with me at the time. And <laughs> uh, my, my roommate and his girlfriend had an intervention telling me all the reasons why I shouldn't do it. You know, I have to work. I have to do this. This is good. They were, they were almost feeding that part of my disease that was telling me like, this is, this is all I could have. And uh, it wasn't their fault, you know? Right. Cause I mean, technically they, I sounded crazy. Yeah. It sounded crazy the, the, I don't know what the stats are on the transition from roofing to dancing, but I'm pretty sure they're not the greatest. And uh, especially at 25. Low. Yeah, yeah. You're starting late. I mean, absolutely. I, mean, I, I don't know the feel. That is but, super late. Yeah, yeah most it's, kids. It's like a thing you're doing from like you're 15 or something. Yeah. Even younger, they yeah. start even younger than that. Yeah. My friend Jay, was at the house that night and he was in the other room and he was also like uh he's he he's a big dreamer he he's like a he does graffiti and art he's amazing at, he did all the artwork in the the barber oh, shop okay yeah it was very nice yep he does that with with spray cans too which is uh he's just super talented and so he has all these passions in, in like the similar field and and he called he was listening to the conversation he was like screw that do it as they were like having the information, he's like, you better do it. And he was like the antithesis of that. And, and I did it. I, I, and it wasn't an easy, it wasn't an easy transition. Like I went down to that same company and the owner of that company, um, one of the owners was a DT that had currently arrested me before. He was an Everett police officer. He knew my history and they still took a risk on me and they allowed me to dance in the company, um, auditioned to dance in the company. And they knew I was like raw 
and um, raw talent, not seasoned, but I had that hunger inside of me and I was committed now. I had the capabilities to commit now and um, and I was I was doing something that I had passion for. So it was like, it was a different feeling. Like I, I was, I was like working very hard at a craft. Whereas at the roof, when I was in the roofers unit, I hide all day and try to nap behind porta potties. Like I wasn't passionate about that. The whole time the foreman was like, he didn't even know my name. He called me Sean. All I could ever hear him, <laughs> he's just like, where the hell is Sean, man? Where is Sean? That's all I used to hear. You look like a Sean. I, yeah, well, I, to him, I was a Sean. And, and I'd like resurface and I'd have a broom in my hand that I'd act like I was sweeping or something. It was terrible. So one year of commitment with uh, recovery and, and dancing and all this stuff. And, uh, and I, they ended up giving me a job teaching. They let me teach my own class and that that class became popular and I was dancing in their company. I got an opportunity to do like a small tour in California with the with the dance group. It just started to the the, the ripple effect started to happen. And um, and then the wild part about it is it's like through that I'm doing all this work on myself. And uh, a year after my father passed away, there was an audition for um uh, this TV show on MTV called America's Best Dance Crew. And uh, my, now my two younger brothers began to pursue dance when they, were, when they were younger. So now they're older, I'm 25, 26, they're like 18 and whatever. And uh, they're dancing super talented, way better than me. And uh, a year after there was this MTV crew, uh, MTV show, the Job Walkies and all that stuff were on it. That's, it was like this famous show and I remember my my stepfather was telling my little brothers like you guys are gonna be on that show one day like you guys gotta do that show and um and so a year after he passed away the auditions were on the they were actually on january 29th and the same day my birthday and that same day wow. and we went to new york we auditioned with a six-person crew and uh we ended up getting on the show you your two brothers and three other guys yep there was three other guys and one female oh okay yep and uh we made the show and it's crazy because the the whole storyline if you if you watch the show was based off of my father and the three of us dancing and they paid tribute to him and um nice yeah and it and it's crazy because i remember the moment being on stage and the way that it works out is you you film at warner Brothers studio it's in burbank burbank california it's like this circular stage and they have these big screens all around and it's like this audience that's in there and they're showing what they call packages right before you dance and uh so it was we, we went out to california now we were like like the misfit underdog crew like all these teams that we were going against were from like all over the world like super professional seasoned and uh and we were just like so out of our element i remember we were on the circular stage my sponsor at the time who was like the the master of speaking to my spirit like you can do this and all the fears he was the antidote the counteractor of like those fears he he like always pushed me to do this stuff pushed me to do the audition and um and i remember communicating with them for like all this stuff i don't know if i can do it and um like just just super support and i remember him being he was sitting in the front row of the filming he flew out to california and i remember watching the package and i'm standing there and the way that we're standing the formation is my youngest brother trey he's in the middle and then it's my brother nico on the left and then it's me and we're standing in like a v formation and the whole package that they play and we don't even know what the package is it's talking about my dad and it's and it's talking about it's like telling that story and it shows my brother talking about my father saying, one day you're going to be on this show. It talks about the anniversary of his death. It showed us auditioning on that, the, on my birthday. the inter And it just played out everything in front of me. And then there's a sound they make to let you know that you're going on. It goes tick, 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 tick. And then the music starts and you just go. It's just like out of body experience, so surreal. Like I'm almost like in tears we're trying to get it together watching this package and then the tick 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 happens and then boom the music starts and we're dancing and like the crowd erupts when we're done and uh my sponsor's in the front row and he's just and he's like this close mind you this close and he's yelling you effing dead ass. he's swearing because he's so up uh, uh sure uh be passionate yeah he's yeah. like you did it you did it yeah. and uh and it 
it was just such a surreal moment. And it was like, I believe in God. And it was just like, uh, just seeing how everything, like that man who taught me about recovery and, and helped me to, to, to open up my mind to believe in the possibilities of anything through walking through fears, the, the internal change, the taking the risks, to pursuing of dreams, path and purpose, to, to leading me through what was once a terrible circumstance of us losing my father and then to watch a tribute of him that's going to be broadcast on national like millions of people to standing next to my two younger brothers in that moment clean it was just like such a surreal moment and uh so we come back from california we came in third place on the show america loved us the only that's reason why we got kicked off is because we fell into the we had to there was a little kid group oh. And America will always love little kids more. <laughs> One little kid group, and they knocked us off. But the publicity coming home, which led me into opening up our own dancing school. And yeah. um, so, is this your first entrepreneurial venture? Yes. Yep. Okay, that's just what I thought. Okay. So, so the dancing school was the first, and um, we we opened that about like five, six months after we came home from California and I opened it with my, my two younger brothers and the same woman in um, the cop that were the ones that gave us the opportunity invested yeah. in us okay. to open it. Nice. Yep. So what did you know about running a business? Nothing. <laughs> did they help? Did, did the investors help with that? And did they help you get set up? I mean, other than... Yeah, there, there was some guidance. I mean, I wasn't even in the beginning... Uh, I just wanted to teach. I didn't really want to learn about too much. I just let Ricky, that was his name, kind of focus on a lot of that. Um, and I started to learn over time. Um, but that was my first experience with uh, being an entrepreneur and being in business. And it was another fear of like thinking that that would never be something that would be possible for me, right? Opening up a business. And, uh, and so I did that for for years, um, just teaching and, and going out and doing different college events and, and working with the youth, the boys and girls club and all that. And at some point there was a transition in, in my passion for what I wanted, right? And, and so like, I call it, I, I, I say God calls I answer or the universe calls I answer. And it's just like, my spirit is like, it starts to open up for something and uh and it usually pulls me in a certain direction and i trust it a lot of the time i used to resist it i trusted it the first time that day that i quit roofing and it led me to that wild ride and then uh that's pretty amazing i have to say I mean, yeah it was <laughs> it was surreal the whole time and even when i was out there i always thought every day that i was out in california like they were gonna pull out my uh my criminal record and be like, yeah, you're, you're not, you're not supposed to be here. Get him out of here. And, uh, it never happened. And just the whole, like, oh, that people only knew who I, so like thinking like who, who I was like and where I'm at. Cause they didn't talk about my addiction on there and, and stuff like that. They didn't even know. Yeah. But, uh, it was actually dancing that led me into being pursuant to get me to where I am here. Okay. So how did, how did the, how, how did that, so, so when did you move into services for for addiction? So it was about six six years ago, um, six or seven years ago. I'm, I'm bad with time, but I remember being in the dance studio, and uh, I was at the front desk, and um, it's, we, our studio was very successful. We had a bunch of kids that were coming there, and um, so the parents would uh, congregate in like this little area. It was like a waiting room. And I was just sitting there typing away, um, doing something. And they were talking about this methadone clinic that was opening up in Saugus. They were like, do you hear about that methadone clinic opening up in Saugus? They were like, I don't want those junkies in my neighborhood. I don't want addicts, this. And they were just, I listened to them for about 20 minutes, just talk so derogatory about addicts and junkies and drug addicts and druggies. And why don't they just, and why don't they just stop? And why don't, like just this, a terrible and I and I wasn't even upset with them because it, it's misinformation they don't understand like there's a stigma there's always been a stigma of, of the assumption of what people think and assume uh, an addict is right like we're like these creatures that crawl out of sewers and stuff like that <laughs> yeah. and like break into your house but 
it's, it's the furthest thing from the truth. We can get to that point where we become creatures, but that's not what, it's not what it, what it is. But I remember sitting there and I'm like, if they only knew, like they're having this conversation so comfortable in front of me because they have no idea. They have no idea who I am. Like who, like, and it wasn't like I was hiding it. It's just that it never, I never really felt, a, it, it was never, like I would, I was very active in the halls, right? Very active in recovery through all like different, like at that point I was super committed to recovery and like 12 step recovery meetings. And I, I was sponsoring a bunch of guys, but we're from anonymous programs, right? Where that's, that was where I was active in anonymous programs. And like, we don't really, you don't post on social media, you don't talk about none of that stuff. So there really would be no reason for them to know. And uh, something clicked inside of me. I was like, I wanted to use my my platform um, because I knew if I told them that, that you know I'm an addict, it would have created like oh my, it would have yeah. changed the dialogue instantly because I knew that they respected me. I knew that they paid for me to teach their kids. Like they drop, they would drop their kids off and trust them with me for hours at a time, you know. And uh, and so it, it and like I told you, the the universe calls or God calls and I answer and something was inside of me. Like I wanna be more invested outside of just my norm of going to the halls, right? Like how do I get people to have more and like cause we can't promote the halls, we can't promote twelve step recovery and all that. So so how do I promote recovery? So you're using this phrase the halls. What does that mean? So the halls is like um what you'd call where meetings take place. So 12 okay. step recovery, like, so AA, okay. NA, CA. So that's essentially the, uh, uh, another word for meetings. Okay. But, um, I went on this whole, I wouldn't call it like a tour, but I started to be more expressive of who I was via social media, via through conversation. Um, I became more and more comfortable with allowing people to know, um, that I was an addict. Like I remember talking to the dance group about it. And just, I wanted it to be more known. And then I started to make it more known. And um, I started to speak at certain events, um, just different local events. They'd have like um, recovery gatherings. They do a lot of recovery stuff. And I would I would speak and I'd give my story and I'd talk about my story of um, recovery. And, and I became drawn to it. And, uh, and, and I had always been one my, my whole time clean that my mother calls me a gatherer of lost souls. And, um, and she's in, in turn pretty much the same as me. She did it through foster care. Uh, I did it through addiction, right? I'd always have people on my couch, people in my home, wherever I lived. I just, I'd always have people with me. And, uh, and so I decided that I, I wanted to open up a sober house. And um, I had a friend, Nick, who was in Florida. Um, he was also an entrepreneur. He's also in, in, in long-term recovery. And, and he opened up his own aviation company. Um, and I remember him having a conversation with me like, oh, you should get into, do something with recovery, stuff like that. You're very passionate. And, and uh, I was like, no, definitely. And, and mind you, at that point, I was super into the power of um, affirmations, uh, uh, intentional thinking, the law of attraction. I was reading like Jack Canfield books. I was reading the secret. I was reading, um, uh, Napoleon Hill books. I was reading, um, a ton of different books. And that's uh, obviously where I got to not having to understand the how, just kind of focusing on the what. And, um, so rise above started with dialogue between two people and, uh, which led to a connection of multiple people that eventually led to the initial, um, entity forming. So it began with the conversation from me and my friend, Pete. I told him I wanted to open up a sober living. And my idea of what I wanted to do for sober living was I wanted to make them real nice. I wanted to put flat screen TVs in them. I wanted to put internet and cable. I wanted people to feel like they were in a home and that, cause a lot of them are like dirty and disgusting. And, 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 and it just, it, it wasn't like a, you didn't feel a sense of pride living there. You felt like it was a punishment and because it was almost like an extension of a shelter and, and there wasn't nice things in there. And it was just like empty bedrooms. And, uh, so, my philosophy out the gate was I wanted to have flat screen TVs and I wanted to have uh, cable and I wanted to brand new furniture and nice mattresses and, and I wanted to go to the houses and I wanted to work recovery with the guys. I wanted to, to have house meetings with them and I wanted to share my experience and I wanted to motivate. 
The problem was I didn't have money. I didn't have yeah, any money. Right, right. That's, I had a, no that's money. a challenge. Right? Yes. <laughs> and, and, and so, and neither did my buddy Pete at the time. He had good credit, but he just didn't have income. We couldn't, we, we thought about buying a house. We couldn't, we couldn't buy a house. So it didn't, it didn't end up working the first couple months, but I was relentless in pursuit. Just, just, I talked about it all the time. Cause now it was like, I told you my yeah. spirit was alive and I wanted it. And, uh, so anybody that would engage in the conversation with me about it, I would just talk about it. And, yeah. um, at the dancing studio, I was at the dancing studio, this, this woman, Chanel, who I had grown up with she had opened up her own yoga business and she was like new to it and she contacted me hey can i do yoga at your dance studio i'll do it for free um i just want to kind of start to market myself and i was like absolutely come through and she came and she did a free yoga class and it was amazing and then she was talking to me after and um she was like so what's new how you been i'm like good she's like so is this all you're doing now just the dance school you're doing this full time i'm like yeah i'm like uh, I'm, I'm dancing i was like but what i of course because i'm in that my place of just relentlessly communicating about what it is that I want. I'm like, I, I really want to open up my own recovery home. And, and it's so random. I was, I guess I'm sometimes obnoxious in pursuit where I'm just <laughs> locking it. Hey, listen to my dreams. Um, and I started to start to tell her what it was that I was trying to do and, and what I wanted to do. And she was like, Oh my God, that sounds amazing. So you guys doing it. I was like, Oh no, we, we, we can't, we can't afford to buy a house right now. I have to, uh, I have to boost up. I have to get more income and, and she was like, you should talk to my brother. I was like, your brother? She was like, yeah, his name is Keith. He owns a bunch of properties. It's like, you should give him a call. Maybe you can do something with him. I was like, okay. And so she gave me Keith's number. I called Keith up mm -hmm. and uh, I met him at a Chick-fil-A in a North Shore mall. And I sat down with him and I gave him that pitch of what it is that I wanted to do. And I didn't even know how he could help or what, what it was. And um, he happened to have a property in and Lynn that he was about to be clear of one floor. He's like, I'll rent it to you. And so it's like, I'll take it. And so we took one floor of a three family and Peter had one credit card and we furnished one floor with his one credit card and maxed out his credit card and began rise above. At that point, we had been offered the whole house. I, I reached out to Justin at that time, who I knew from recovery. And, um, and Justin is your partner here? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. And he was working at a private equity company at the time. I asked him if he wanted to do, I knew we just, we just ran out of money in the first, like we, like out the gate, I was like, I don't know about our business model right now, but it's not looking too bright for the future. And so he was another one that's super passionate about recovery. He had had like 14 years clean at that time or 15. And uh, he was actually one of my first sponsors. Oh, um, okay. So that's how you met him. Mm -hmm. was, was through, through he sponsored process. me during my years of resistance when I wasn't willing to. Okay. So he sponsored me in the very beginning. Okay. All right. I asked him to be involved and he was like, absolutely. I would love that. And uh, he ended up coming on board and. As a partner in the. As a partner. Yeah. Okay. And then that essentially led to, we had that full house and. So how does, how does sober living work? So that's not an area. That's not a. It's not a, a service I'm all that familiar with. How, how does it? How does one come to be in a sober living facility? What are the services you provide? And then, kind of, what's the business model behind that for, for the person running the or, or the or the organization itself? Well, uh, so again, our business model wasn't the greatest in the beginning <laughs> because we were taking people in with no money, with no jobs. Because that was the, from, from my experience, what, what I had seen was one of the biggest gaps going into treatment was people would go to 30 day treatment and they'd leave 30 day treatment. They'd have nowhere to go. And in order to get into some of these other places, they'd have to have money and a job. But most people that are coming out of treatment don't have money or a job. So then there was that gap of like what to do. And so we did the crazy thing, which everybody told us we were crazy the whole time, which is so funny. And maybe we were right with the flat screen TVs and the making them real nice and all oh, their addicts are going to steal everything. And Oh, you're going to let it move in for free and then they're never going to pay you. And uh, the opposite happened. Like the opposite happened. People treated our houses. They didn't want to get kicked out. They wanted to follow the rules. They wanted to get a job quickly so they could stop paying rent. So they weren't going to get asked to leave in a month. And uh, our basic premise was this. So we, 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 we established realistic circumstances on, within sober living. We wanted to develop a sober living that was based on reality 
because a lot of one, a lot of sober living programs had like rules that were you weren't allowed to go out, you weren't allowed to have guests, you weren't like all these things. Like you, you, you had all these rules, and I was like, that's not realistic. What are we setting someone up for? So we would allow you to have guests if you had a significant other. They could come visit, hang in the house. You, you could have a TV in your bedroom. We put the TVs in the bedroom, internet, cable. And like our mandatory things were that you had to participate in a pathway of recovery, whichever one of you choosing. You had to be at house meetings. You had to breathalyze at night and you had to yearn. You had to pass UAs. And we would do the house meetings and then they would get slip signed to, for where they were going. And that was essentially our model, right? So we allowed them to, to operate and function as if they were in their own apartment, except they had basic rules of what we believe to be essential in the foundation of development for sustainability and recovery. So the, so living there is kind of a treatment and or how, how, how do you, how, how do you frame? What, what does that mean? So what I is call, it that you're after by living there. So that it's the, it's, it's the community component. A lot of people aren't necessarily ready to just go out right out on their own without the accountability. Right. So, it's because there's, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stuff that we essentially have to work on before we feel prepped. Uh, a lot of what you see, what my experience is being around for a long time, people rush right back into like life and the and everything that comes with that, like all these bills. Like get my own apartment now. I have a car payment and I have this job and I have to pay child support and I have all this wreckage from my past that I'm trying to clear up and I'm trying to go to meetings but I'm not getting to meetings because I have financial responsibility which is in and you see just them deteriorate and it's, it's too much too quick. So this is what we call transitional living where you're essentially, it's a hundred dollars to a hundred and fifty. Well, we range from a hundred to 200, depending on where you live weekly and uh, which we give the, the leeway when you move in to give you time to find a job and then everything's included, which is laundry, your electric, your cable, your internet, all that stuff. So now you have that one bill that you focus on to pay and you can focus on recovery and you can have your kids at the house. You can begin a slow transition into life on life's terms with the support system and structure of house managers, ownership, recovery coaching, house meetings, and then the overall general community of people in similar positions, some that have been there for two years, some that have been there for eight months, but uh, a plethora of experience, strength and hope that you can tap into to see not only, okay, this is where I am, but this is, look at where they're at now and they started where I'm at and to kind of be able to be reliant on other people's experience and to not ever classify yourself as unique again, you know, like to, it's just, it's, it's such a, for me, such an important, uh, vital role in early recovery to have yourself in the safe space, the safe housing, the community, yeah. just until you establish like. And um, so from the business side, so it's, it's basically runs on rent. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to be, that's it. I mean, it's, so it's rent. I mean, rent. Yep. Um, and so what was your problem with your business model? You said you were kind of, was it, <laughs> did, you didn't find the right people right away? Or? No, 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 no. It's, well, it's not even that. It's not it's, high enough rent or. Well, no, it's, it's that, so we've always, it's, it's more about the integrity of the program rather than the financial, right? So mm -hmm. as long as we operate with what we call like spiritual principles and integrity. So just, mm -hmm. just the overall, so we've never, we don't kick people out over money. Well, no, I, I mean, in the beginning, you said you're, you were having trouble with the, your business model. What was, what oh was yeah, because there was a ton of money coming out being invested in and there wasn't a ton of money coming in <laughs> in the beginning. Okay, it was so. just because you didn't have occupancy at that point. No, and okay. then the people that were occupying weren't paying. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah. Right. so okay. we were scholarshiping <laughs> from the very beginning, okay. you know, like, yeah. which so. if I was trying to pitch that to a private equity group, they probably would have been like, <laughs> I don't see what this is and okay. we'll pass, yeah. All right, so you got past that. So, yes, but no, and, like, it, we started with this group and, and us scholarshipping people and us allowing people to come in with that were indigent with no money and to give them an opportunity to succeed in less stressful circumstances is why we blew up so quick. So what once thought everybody thought we were crazy for, which is housing people for free coming out of programs and giving the people the opportunity to fall three, four, five weeks behind on rent and not kicking them out over money and just working with like 
each individual on an individual basis, just as long as their recovery was first and foremost, and as long as they were putting in the effort in pursuit to, to, to find a job, or if we could see that they were working towards, we would leave them alone and we would help in that. And that was the reason why we went ba-boom so fast, why we went from that one little apartment of six beds to 170 in the course of four years. Wow. Okay. So you more than that one building. Right? Yes. 170 beds in four years. Wow. So how did that growth happen? Where are the homes? and? So they're all over. Um, so we have a female house in Malden who's run that in... All Massachusetts is all women, and that's run by Nicole White, who is the, the owner of Rise Above Massachusetts, because we kind of just broke it off into states. Um, and then Rise Above New Hampshire, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven in New Hampshire. Wow. Eleven different homes in New Hampshire. And uh, that's myself, Justin, and Nick my original friend that oh, okay i talked about earlier but yeah and it grew fast because the only other sober living programs when we first came out here were like 2500 a month and you first last and there wasn't a lot of options for people 2500 dollars a month to live in one yeah some of them were up to five grand that's a lot of money yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah so they said it's a small market Okay. There was people well, that would go there. People that yes. Yeah. Wealthy families or Yeah. Okay. And then we came in and we were like, we'll work with what you got. And then obviously the phone started pouring in. Yeah. The phone calls from different facilities and, and different places. And so you're charging a price point where ordinary people could yep. without without family support could have potentially exactly. afford. Not only we, we it's affordable, but if you don't have it in the beginning, um, we give you the, the leeway of time to find something that can ultimately pay $150 a week, a job um, uh -huh. or something. And sometimes, I mean, there's different scholarship programs that we help with people. So not only do we get them linked up with money that's available through the state that will pay for their first month. So then they're, they've got a month paid up and then our leeway of two to three weeks. So they essentially got a month and a half to find a job, which is like a breath of fresh air for someone coming from a treatment center into sober living without having that like, uh, even if someone gave them the money to move in and the rent's due the following week, there's that constant pressure. Yeah. So. You mentioned the state provides some support for that? The state has scholarship programs. Yep. Scholarship programs, okay. There's different, but, but different nonprofits that will provide money. Yes. Okay, so you can get, so people who are in need can potentially, there are sources of funding. To, oh yeah, um, yep. Um, okay. So, so you, you grew this program, the um, Rise Above. I mean, so from Rise Above, the, the Sober Living, when did you and Justin start thinking about the Process Recovery Center where we're sitting today? Um, so I think it was about two, maybe a year and a half, two years that we were just Rise Above. And I had a friend, Nick, who was in Florida, who had started his own aviation company and um, another entrepreneur and, and um, he was familiar because he had gone through like a treatment center many years ago in florida that's why he was out there still he had graduated turned his life around he had um, a good amount of clean time and he was an entrepreneur and he always used to tell us that uh because we were running such a successful sober living he was like you should add the treatment element to it and um that way because a lot of people that would come to us would be going to outside treatment centers while living with us. They would go to different IOPs. They'd have to commute to Manchester or they'd be at Harbor Homes or they'd be at different places. So he was like, if you guys want to do that, I'll invest. I'll invest in, because again, we didn't, we didn't have the, we weren't, we were in debt for the first two and a half years, almost three years with Rise Above. So we didn't have like a bank account full of money ready to right. pursue the Start next. another venture. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So... With his financial support, we decided to bring the treatment component of it so that, so we all, we opened up the process recovery center and a small office on Kinsley street in Nashua it was about 1300 square feet, this little office. And, um, how did you come to Nashua? So you were, your, your home base is, is Lynn. Yep. Area. So how did you wind up up here? Was that just part of the growth of the... Of no, the it was all by co coincidence. Or maybe not even coincidence. So Amy Cloutier, she was 
we almost didn't come to New Hampshire. It's so, it's so funny because now the whole everything, because I didn't know New Hampshire. I didn't know that there was a problem in New Hampshire. I, I didn't know that, that anything was needed in this area. I didn't have familiarity with it. So that real estate, the guy that owned the properties, he had the house in Lynn and he had another house, which was in Nashua. And uh, okay. he offered it to us and we said no in the beginning. <laughs> okay. My friend had met this girl named Amy at a concert who happened to live in Nashua. And they, they, she was in recovery and he was in recovery and they probably dated briefly for about three weeks. But within those three weeks, he brought her to meet myself, Justin and Nicole. And uh, we were talking to her about sober living and what we do. And she was super passionate about recovery and she lived in New Hampshire. And she was like, oh my God, you guys have to come to New Hampshire, please. I'll help you guys. It's so needed. and. Uh, she convinced us into taking the house in Nashua. And then Nashua, the demand for, when I tell you we grew from four, from that one little apartment to the 170 beds, but probably 140 of them are in New Hampshire. Really? Wow. Yeah. So Nashua was like the, the need instantly. And then her she she helped us so she introduced us to different people up here and we came up here and um my, justin actually got clean when he was 17 in nashua yeah, sure. okay so he had familiarity with new hampshire and um now i live in new hampshire it was like just the universe or whatever pulling us in a certain direction and mass is flooded with different treatment centers and it, there's a ton of state-funded programs where when i came out here i was like you mean there's only two detoxes in this whole state there's only that many treatment centers, like whereas Mass, you can, I could name 20 detoxes and 50 programs. And whereas in Hampshire, they were like Keystone Hall and Farnham. And that's it? Is that it's still it? Pretty much, yeah. There's probably like four okay. that I know of. Green okay. Mountain now is okay. one. All right. Still, that's not a lot for a whole state. No, I mean, it's a small state, but we have a lot of problems with, with yeah. addiction. One of the worst per capita in the, right. in the whole country. Right. It's either the worst or one or the like second yeah. worst. <laughs> yep. I, that's actually not funny. But but you know yeah, no, what's I, sad is is that we only have a handful of detoxes when we have so much need. Yeah. And a handful of programs too. Yeah. So which is and then all of a sudden we went to the, the treatment component of it, which was we were based in Nashua, the need was Nashua, the sober living was blown go, growing so fast in Nashua. So we were like, we'll open up the treatment component of it in in Nashua and then we outgrew this little office on Kinsley Street within five months. It was like, we couldn't fit in there no more, which obviously led us to this office here. Yeah. Um, and then the treatment component, we, we, we hired um, a medical director, we hired a clinical director, um, we had therapists, and um, we just basically started as just an IOP. In the, so we've expanded, uh, we're now a PHP, IOP, and outpatient, so we're a, partial hospitalization, transitioning into intensive outpatient, transitioning into outpatient, which then transitions into recovery coaching. So we, we've grown and adapted. So, uh, so just kind of, I, I know you, you've got multiple um, service levels and I wanted to ask you about those, but just kind of continue with the, with the IOP service. You said three hours a day of, 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 of therapy, of, mm -hmm. group, of group. Yes. And who leads those? Is it a therapist? Is it Yep. So it's a, th so different therapists. And then uh, a lot of the times the therapists will bring in recovery supports, they call recovery support specialists. So people like myself, people with in long-term recovery to, okay. to share experience, strength, and hope. Sometimes we'll bring in yoga instructors. Sometimes we'll bring in a holistic, it's a different variation. We like to keep, cause anything over and over again, the same thing. And yeah. in the use, I've seen clinicians try to run a bunch of groups consecutively and I see that it, it tires them out after the time, it tires the clients out. Um, but when we, we like to break it up. So out of those three hours you're getting, sometimes we'll do hour and a half of one, hour and a half of another. Sometimes you'll get one hour, one hour, one hour, three different things. And, um, and it's, it's whatever our clinical director deems that she wants for that week. Um, we've had guest speakers come in. Um, we actually, we've had um, all types of different contributions to like the group component of it, which is cool. So, so we, we've been talking about IOP, but you mentioned just a second ago, you also have partial hospitalization as well as um, 
uh, uh, something below intensive outpatient? So yeah, OP, outpatient. Which so just is, outpatient. Yep. Okay. And then recover. Uh, and then what was the the next? Recovery coaching. Recovery coaching. So, what is the difference between partial hospitalization and intensive outpatient? We go from so it's six hours a group now. Oh wow. Yeah, six hours a group a day, broken up obviously, and then with like breaks to eat, and so six hours a group, five days a week, which provides like so. Someone's coming directly into our program from detox mm -hmm. and they weren't able to get residential level of care. It's the closest thing to outside of a residential that you're going to get residential. So when you see when you're living in our housing, so you have the structure of the housing and then you're in groups for six hours a day and you're seeing the doctor or the, the medical director on a weekly basis. And you're seeing the because like an IOP, you see the 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 medical director once and then you don't see him again until you have to do a follow-up visit or with php you're seeing them every week you're being monitored every week okay. um there's comfort meds as far as like if you're still not sleeping not comfort as far as like any kind of methadone or suboxone but we're talking about comfort meds as far as like sleep maybe stomach issues or, or whatever the the effects are of coming directly out of detox you know there's more structure okay yeah six hours is a lot of yeah, a lot of attention. Yeah. Right. Okay. So somebody comes out of detox, they come, they, 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 so you actually have kind of, you've got the, um, the housing mm -hmm. as well as the treatment mm -hmm. and, and that's linked together. So you, you have people going to your housing. They may or may not also use your treatment. Correct. Okay. But you offer that as an option so they can move into the housing, start with partial hospitalization. How long, what's kind of an, I don't know if there is a normal, but what is the kind of normal progression if there is one? we like to kind of have some cohesiveness with how the program runs to the best of what we can do so you're looking at generally two to three weeks of php two to three weeks of five-day iop then a transition into three-day iop which is either nights or days depending on if they're working or not okay and then right into outpatient and recovery coaching by so that point they're working they're it's like four months clean I mean, it'd be hard to hold down a job and be in partial hospitalization, I would imagine. Yes. Oh, well, yeah, that's a, that's a lot of uh, treatment requirements. Yeah. 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 I mean, if you're doing six hours of treatment a day. So, but at some point in that, if you move to IOP, maybe yep. the people start to find work at that point. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Because they're, they're here for three hours. And so they're done essentially by noon. So that's usually when they're on job search. Usually by the time they attain a job. To transition them right into whatever their schedule requires, either nighttime or daytime. It's just our way of, I like to have them continuing to be in treatment while working because it helps them have to, to, it begins the development of the proper structure, right? Because a lot of them, they get the job and the, the focus is I got to work, I got to get money, I got all these things that I, and they need that constant reminder of like, nope, we need to stay focused in a process of growth and change, right? We need to make sure that we have sustainable sustainable recovery and we have the ability to sustain this job and it's not short-sighted you know yeah. get them to continue to see the big picture so outpatient then so uh, you're out of iop you're into outpatient and recovery coaching mm -hmm. what is um so what kind of uh, what kind of care are you getting if when you're an outpatient no, patient. So that's uh, all patient is to be utilized by the client the best way they see fit. So some of them will want to continue to, so they don't have to come in at all. But so there's an hour group once a week. That's just to kind of touch base. And then a lot of them want to continue to see their, their, their therapist or they continue to see Linda, who's the, the medical director. And with that, they have the opportunity to still do an individual if they're struggling. And so they're not just removed from our system where they can't receive our, our services. And so it's a, it's a way to, between the outpatient and the recovery coaching is to carry people for longer lengths of time within the parameters of the, the treatment. Because once we close out a chart and once we're, it's, it's HIPAA now that is, we, we can't, you can't just come in and be in a group now and sit down and utilize the services without signing the proper documentation, without going through the whole okay. intake process. So, it's our, our, our way of still being accessible. Okay. And recovery coaching? Yeah. So pretty much majority of us are recovery coach uh, certified. Oh, okay. and some of us are CRSWs, which is certified recovery support worker, um, which is a step above that. 
So recovery coaching is you you just you get assigned a recovery coach who comes up with a goals list and a lot of them are already familiar with us mm -hmm. because we have a ton of recovery support workers in here with long lengths of clean time that are passionate about this. So they were assigned one of us who was just at that point continuing to either meet with them on an individual basis or meet with them in a group setting or we, we established like a baseline of eight goals for the foreseeable future, short, short, short term and long term that they want to accomplish. And, and we, we just continue the dialogue of where we're at, how we're doing. It's, it's our way of just not allowing, it's not even not necessarily not allowing, but just keeping the connection and uh, just continuing to be a voice in, in clients' lives that come through like that, continue speaking to that part of their spirits and that belief. How many organizations like Process Recovery Center are there in, in Nashua and or New Hampshire? Are you, are you aware? You have a, I don't want to give you, expect you to give me an exact number, but are, are there a lot? Is it easy to find one? Is it, is it a challenge? There's a few. Um, there's not a ton. I mean, off the top of my head, I know of about five total. And they're all different variations. Um, not uh, there's not one of them that's the full continuum of uh, what we do. So from okay. like from partial down to to all the way to transitional living, where we have people that have been with us for multiple years. Um, wow. Yeah. So we don't have an expiration date. Um, there's a lot of treatment centers similar to us in the PHP, but once you graduate, you've you're getting referred out. Like we to actually get a lot of referrals into our sober living from other programs. Okay. A lot of people don't want to deal with this. Deal with? Sober living, the, what comes with sober living. Okay. It's not highly profitable and it is a lot of work. Okay. And it's actually my favorite part. Yes. Yeah. That's where the magic and that's where it's very easy to, to work with someone in the confines of like a residential facility where they're not allowed to make calls, make decisions. They don't have their phone. They don't have their, they're on the, the site and the premise, but dealing with addicts and, or people who suffer from substance use and early recovery, like just in real life, like watching, that's where they need the most help. That's where I needed the most help. When I got my first job, when I had my phone back, when I was talking to people, I shouldn't have been talked to when I was, struggling with behaviors like that's what happens in our sober living community real life situations and that's what we actually get to help like you get to see things unfold in real time in the, in their they're happening to them while they're still in the confines of like support it's when they need support the most but it's also when we're the craziest addicts <laughs> and early, addicts are in early recovery we're out of our minds right you go from a suppression of all emotions to a complete abundance of emotions that has that makes no sense. That's just a roller coaster ride, and it's up and down. It's up and down, and yeah. and uh, we're resistant. We're not resistant. We're happy. We're not happy. We're we're, we're gung ho recovery. We're anti recovery. Uh, it's just it makes no sense, and you just kind of kind of weather the storm and continue to just be a a consistency. And yeah, it's not it's not the easiest. I always say you, you got to be a special breed of like the people that work for me and work with me are like saints. Yeah. It's, it's not, you got to be a special, you got to have a special type of patience internally to, to deal with it, to not allow your personal frustration and stuff like that to get in the way. Cause you get challenged constantly. It's a challenging job. I, I, I can only imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, people are going through a lot to, mm -hmm. during that time. Okay. Yeah. Um, so you're the, let's talk about your role here. So you're the COO, mm -hmm. Chief Operating Officer. What, what does that uh, entail? Um, my day to days, uh, I just, I, ultimately I do a variation of things, right? When we first started, I, I assigned COO because it was a cool title and I just Googled cool titles for, uh, for businesses and I assigned myself that. I'm not even sure what the complete definition of that is even means. Okay. Cool. It just sounded cool and I wanted to put it on a business card because <laughs> it made me feel professional. I will literally do any facet of, I, I love it all. So I, I like to run, I run different groups. I'm a, I'm a student to recovery and um, I'm a student to self-help and self-discovery, and I'm a student to the, the power of our minds. And I love sharing the information that I gather. Um, 
And I love entering in dialogue back and forth. I love when they ask me questions and it challenges my thought. And I, and I love to, to, to attack other people's barriers of entry that they've set for themselves because they all have the greatest excuses. And, and it's easy for me to attack them because they were once my excuses, you know. Yeah my life that I live now is currently like the opposite of what my, ex it's, it contradicts what my belief systems once were in a lot of people's lives. And so there's the group element and then there's the, the community element. So being out in the community, speaking very active in the, in the recovery community, in the housing itself, like with the, like we have community meeting for our housing specifically where we gather everybody and we bring in speakers and then, we have house meetings and I'm active in that. I do manage staff, but we have staff that really doesn't require being managed. Um, I'm more, they call me a morale guy here around here. Okay. I just, I like to come in and boost people's spirits and cause it does wear on us after a while, you know, doing this, sure. um, dealing with the disease. So I come in here and just where there's uh, help that need uh, that, that could, uh, I could participate in an area that, that we're, we're struggling in. I'll, I'll literally jump into to yeah. any scenario. So, How many staff do you have? We talked about your, your clinical staff. How many, um, how many staff do you have? Like, so in the process? Um, we have... I believe. I thought I had it written down. It's all right. I believe 27 that work here in, in the process recovery center yep okay that work in out of the, out of the so 27 we actually have more than 27 so there's 27 overall staff from all the different entities that are in recovery and out of those 27 um 13 of them or 14 of them we've hired from our own community from either coming through here or coming through the sober living. Wow. Yeah. And, uh, and then obviously we have the different entities, um, with, cause we, we eventually, we started our own billing company too. Your own medical billing, medical billing company. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's actually what my partner Nick runs. Now this, uh, we open up the mind of that you can do anything it's and you essentially start to walk through fears you i mean you can learn how to do anything and our only barrier to entry is like whether we're afraid to do it or not and understanding that the worst that can happen is the information that was necessary that we needed will be provided and it, it ultimately just pushes out what we were trying to do to a later date right so if we fail in the beginning that failure provides the information that we needed that we didn't have to put into place so that it won't fail the next time, which everything that I've done from beginning to end, everything that we've done as a, as a unit, all, us, all the different partners I've had is trial and error. And, I, and, and we've screwed up a ton of stuff, but it's been the most valuable screw ups that I've ever had in my life, right? Because it transitioned and changed things into like, okay, now I know. And now obviously it opened up new directions and and that's why, and I always lived in this place of fear where I had to understand every little bit and detail of everything before I did something. So I always sat still and never did anything. And then since that day that I walked off that roof and I had no idea of, how, well, how's this going to work out? Logically thinking it wasn't the greatest idea, but it worked itself out anyway, because I was just, I, I was, I was clear on, on my intention and, and what I wanted to happen. And that's essentially all this. Right. So our billing company has people in recovery that work there too. And it's run by Nick, who's one of my best friends, who's also in recovery. Yeah. We essentially took something where we used to have someone do the medical billing for us and it cost a lot of money. And then we went, why don't we do our own billing company? Okay. And you, but you now market that service to other yeah. organizations. Well, as well. We actually currently bill for other organizations okay. now. Yeah. Wow. Yep. Uh, how many other organizations? I mean, so you've got a barbershop, you've got all these, um, uh, uh, all these uh, sober living facilities. You have the treatment facility. You have the medical billing. What else are you? Uh, what else are you? What else are you guys doing? We have Integrate, which is uh, in Nashua. Integrate is essentially similar to the process, but it's 
it's an in-network facility. So this is an out of network in cash pay, which is uh, specific to certain insurance and integrate is in network with Medicare or Medicaid and all insurance types. So now we're able to provide services to anybody with uh, any insurance. So here you don't, you don't take Medicaid for patients coming here. We take New Hampshire healthy families here. Okay. That is the only one that we take. And then at integrate, we take all insurances, any type where, just the reason why we initially, when we started this, we only were out of network because the process of going in network with an insurance provider would take so long. And with opening up treatment, you have to have certain entities on payroll and staff. And so you need to have income coming in to be able to pay the, the, the staffing requirements and everything that's going on. So we started out of network because it was easier from the business model. Now we're going in network. So you have another, another treatment facility mm -hmm. integrated. Yes. They, do they do the same levels of treatment? Uh, yep. So right now it's start. It's just IOP recovery coaching and outpatient. There. Wow. Are you building up to? Yep. PHP. Wow. Yep. Wow. A lot of stuff going on. No, no, absolutely, and it's it's been a. I mean, between that and then revive the re, the resource center. Yeah. So I, so I wanted to ask you about that. Is that that's a not for profit yes. entity that you have? And what do they do? So they provide services to the community, anybody indigent, no insurance, no money, not clean, nothing. They can walk into the resource center and they could receive recovery coaching. They could go to, cause there's free meetings there, uh, seven days a week. They do, I actually just got the annual report from over there. It's pretty awesome, but you can literally walk in there, get help with uh, a job application. You can get linked up with the different New Hampshire programs that state programs that can help you with finding a job or if you're seeking out treatment or if you're trying to get insurance, you don't have insurance or if you just need guidance. It's just open to anybody. It's, it's operated by an amazing team of certified recovery support workers. We actually have granite pathways in the same building. They, they're actually renting a space from us upstairs now, which is another nonprofit. And it's just like a community organization. So it's, you, you don't have to commit to it. You don't have to live. The, it's just, a lot of people just go in there and utilize it for what it is, or they attend the free yoga or the free meditation or the different 12 step meetings, or there's health realization meetings, there's Buddhist meetings. It's like everything that, that you could possibly get introduced to in any pathway of recovery. It's, it's there to go check out and there's resources there. So do you guys, do, does, do your other businesses help finance that? organization or is it primarily grants and donations or how does so, that work? so in the beginning our uh so we had to put up some money in the beginning obviously uh ourselves and amy cloutier and alec alex and Ignost, um which is her fiance we put up the money essentially we we applied for the grant through the process and then we developed revive because we had to be an existing entity already and then we we developed a 5013c and um we received money from the state to, to start revive and and essentially now we're just we we have a board that we all sit on for the the nonprofit and revive is self sufficient and sustainable now and doing wow. awesome things yeah that's neat most people don't ever you know quit the job mm -hmm. the way you did and and kind of make the jump to be an entrepreneur what's a, what's an entrepreneur life like <laughs> uh -huh. it's peaks and valleys that's for sure yeah um, it's but for me, I truly genuinely believe that we're put on this. Uh, this is just my belief system. Some people may want to argue with me, but I believe that we're put on this earth. To, and, and our sole mission is to find what our path and purpose is. You have to do something in your life that's fulfilling to you, right? Otherwise, I feel like you're selling yourself short at, at the full experience of life. And I've lived on the other side and I've fallen prey to the ideals that were like embedded in me from whether it be society or you're just supposed to shut up and work hard and take care of and just be grateful for what you have. And, you know, and I, no one ever talked. I didn't hear a lot of people just saying, go for it, follow your heart, follow your dreams or, or be in pursuit of path and purpose. If you don't know what it is, like be in a place of discovery, like at least start with the, the identification that you want to do something fulfilling. That could be the first step towards that, whatever that is fulfilling and just take the steps necessary that will ultimately take you closer to, to finding what, what that is and understand that that first initial step through that first door will, 
will we'll take you through a ride down many different doors that'll lead you to a place that you probably never expected to be doing something that maybe you never expected to do but all the while it's 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 fulfilling and it's providing you that path and purpose especially with addicts i, I i'm a firm believer in developing a life worth living otherwise it's going to be hard to stay clean you can't get clean off of drugs and then be in a relationship you hate with a job that you hate uh, living in a place that you hate and having friends that you despise and think that you're going to be staying clean forever you know <laughs> normal people drink in those circumstances <laughs> like what yeah. do you expect us to do right, right. right. so I, I wanted to ask you like how what does how does being an addict influence your the being an entrepreneur so it was once it's actually a benefit to yeah. to to be honest because we have addicts have minds that are relentless relentless in pursuit right mm -hmm. um some of the most creative where where we've and especially when i say the power of the mind right uh and i won't go too deep into this but the power of the mind is first revealed to especially addicts because the subconscious mind uh, reveals itself to us especially in active addiction and it's the most uh like the my best experience of it to see it in the beginning was actually through active addiction when i try to explain the power of our subconscious mind and and why it's so important to identify the what don't focus on the how let the subconscious mind do the work for you that people don't get it and and i give them the experience of like inactive addiction that's that's the clearest instance of the subconscious mind going to work because the the direction that you're you're setting and the intention is so so clear use get high right that's what it is in the subconscious mind because we're creative people especially in, in active addiction find a way to get high with a 320 dollars a day habit right so there was many a moments where i would find myself in defeat sick on the couch wherever it was or maybe homeless or wherever and i'd be given up right and and and, and i'm like i don't i can't do this no more i just want to i just want to die I just and i'm just in the victim place and i'm feeling bad for myself and i have no hustle left in me and i'm just laying there and then out of nowhere out of nowhere a thought comes to the forefront of my mind that reminds me of this change jar that was in my great aunt sally's basement that I seen six years ago and, and it was full of quarters and it's and it's a and it's a picture in the forefront of my mind showing me this this change jar that I had once seen at some time six years ago that was in the basement of my great aunt Sally's house who lives in in east wherever and and it's reminding me of this now I haven't thought of aunt Sally or that change jar in seven years and it's not like I discuss that often but in my time of defeat where I've just completely given up my subconscious mind goes oh no here it is. Let's go. That's how we're using. And I find myself in a car driving to East wherever to Aunt Sally's house to creep outside so I can break in. And lo and behold, there's a change job full of quarters. There's two of them now because she's been stacking up. And although that's a terrible set of circumstances, like obviously robbing my Aunt Sally and all that yeah. stuff, that's just a, uh, an example of how my subconscious mind, how powerful it is. And how, how hard it was working for me because I gave it a directive. Napoleon Hill says a subconscious mind doesn't, doesn't take into account good and bad. It just takes direction and goes to work. And to be careful of what our intentions are for our life. Like to be clear with what we want. And uh, so that was the first sense of clarity in, in my subconscious mind providing, right? And, and that's the same with the entrepreneurship. Although there's a million reasons why we're going to screw this up, I do it anyway. I can always think of a million reasons why it will go wrong. There's always a million reasons. I, every time I clear out one fear, there's another fear that's going to, it's, it's, it's essentially if I'm waiting and allow, I'm waiting for myself to give me permission to do something, I'm going to be waiting forever. If I'm waiting for myself to give me complete permission, it's the idea of doing it sometimes against my own will, which is most of the times against my own fear and just taking the step and trusting in that it's going to work itself out and the information will be provided that I need. And at worst case, my failure isn't necessarily a failure. It's just, a, it's just, it's just new information that I, I, I had to acquire in order for me to get closer to where it is that I want to be. And that I will always be the only barrier in front of me. That's it. Because everything else is, is, is workable. Everything else can be fixed, right? So with the entrepreneurial, it's like, if I go in with the mindset that I can't make a mistake and that I have to get it right, no matter, like, the then I'm already setting myself up for failure. If I go into it open-minded with a sense of humility, 
and allowing myself to be teachable in these moments and ask questions and take the bumps and bruises when they come and don't panic and bail when it when we fall into debt two hundred thousand dollars with sober living. But but my but trusting in like okay. I can, I can quit now because this is anxious and it's giving me anxiety and I'm, I have fear or I could continue to push forward because I believe in this. So it's just a, it's a matter of the, making sure the mind is in the right place and not so focused on the wrong things. One of the things you uh, said in your, uh, in your bio that I was reading, you said a lot, of, a lot of people are misinformed about addiction. Some of the most amazing people are addicts. What, is, what would you say is the thing that people outside of of this field uh, uh, that who, who work in the field least understand about. So what's a misperception maybe that you have to, you, you might maybe not have to, but you, you often hear and um, you know, would like to correct. There were uh, there, a lot, but yeah, I mean, <laughs> the biggest thing for me is that we're bad people, right? That it's like, um, and, 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 and it, it bums me out the worst is because that a lot of, the struggle, especially why I hire a ton of people in, in, in recovery or in act, that struggle from what I struggle from is that the, the opportunity that's available and accessible, it, it's, it becomes a lot, we have to work around what's completely accessible. Like I used to lie on um, job applications. Have you been convicted of a felony? I used to say no, knowing that it would come back, but hoping that I could show them how good of a worker I was mm -hmm. before it came back so that they would keep me, right? And, uh, and just that uh, uh, assumption of like, that we're these, these the stigmatized idea of, of who we are or the type of people we are, because what kind of a human could hurt, could rob from his family, or what kind of a human could put a needle in his arm, this whole perception, but to understand that, what took place to get us to that point, right? Where my mother is my best friend and I love her more than anything in this world. And I was put in a place where I was willing to, to steal from her and hurt her and, and utilize my, her fear of me dying against her to manipulate her, to get her to, to give to me, right? Whether it be money or whatever, it's not who I am. That's not, it's never who I wanted to be. That was a product and a circumstance of what it is that I suffer from. And I know there's a lot of people that struggle with this is in the disease and, and that's fine. I don't need to convince the regular world that this is, this is the disease. I just need to convince the people that are struggling like I'm struggling that this is a disease that needs to be treated. And that the second that they are clean, they do now have a choice. They have a choice to gather the information and to actually apply it into uh, changing their lives. So it's, for me, the, 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 the correction would be to a lot of the, the, the places that are unwilling to hire based off of criminal records, especially drug history. And um, to the, the, the people that aren't willing to give opportunities, you know, um, the strength and power that it takes someone to get themselves to a place where they have multiple years clean and they've turned their lives around is actually someone that would be an asset into any work environment because to what this person had to go through to essentially change and to combat the mental and internal struggle is, is something that it's tough to understand, but it's, it's literal internal and mental warfare. When you can get that, that person that's willing to, to do whatever it takes to completely change their life around and to get their family back, their kids back, and to work through this and to do the internal change and to acknowledge all this stuff and to help people, you put that person in an environment of opportunity in a business setting and they create stuff like this with no education. Now, I had to create my own opportunity for myself earlier on, mm -hmm. but like there's people that, I mean, there's, there's, this isn't this i'm not the exception you know there's there's people that have the capabilities to do this all over the place provided the right opportunity one of my right hand people here is a woman that paroled to us from jail she runs pretty much she's the hardest and most important one of the most important people that i have working for me and her name is michelle yeah she was a hardened prison did eight years in jail, all this, lost her kids, just all this stuff. And she's been with us for five years. She has a relationship with her kids. She bought a home. She's the, one of the first people that went from sober living to uh, purchasing a home, from directly from sober living to buying a house. Because while she was with us, we let her live for free. She managed, we gave her a job. She worked her butt off to continue to grow within the company and become an asset and one of the most important people. And she's creep. The opportunity was provided. Right. And I can't picture this place without her. 
and that that's not that's not uncommon it's just the uncommon thing is for people to see past that and instead of seeing what you have perceived as a weakness or someone that's weak or drug addict all that stuff to see the strength that's in those people yeah because it takes a lot of strength to continue to get up i used to be just as surprised as everybody else when i relapse and get high again i used to be just as devastated i didn't know what i didn't know I didn't have the understanding. I didn't know how to treat this. So just as my mother was devastated and like, what the hell? I thought you were doing great. So was I. So until I'm a bad person, I'm a, I'm this terrible human being. No, I'm naive and I don't have the proper information or the tools to equip myself for actual sustainability and recovery. That's all that it was. You know, I, I was, I, as I mentioned, I, you know, visited with um, Craig and Seth this morning. They have a tremendous amount of respect for you and they appreciate your leadership. Craig said he grew up with you mm -hmm. and he said, he, you know, that Chris said, saved my life multiple times. You know, so, so how do you know who to make a bet on? So you made a bet on Michelle, mm -hmm. paid off. Yep. How do you, so as a leader, how yep. do you pick the people that you're going to, give opportunities to, give responsibilities to, how do, you, how, do you, how do you know this person has the potential to be an asset to the organization? Well, for me, I have the luxury of watching a lot of people's process unfold right before my eyes. Okay. Extended interview. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, trust me, there's been some swing and misses. Yeah. I mean, and I don't regret any of them for, because there's been many a home run. But for me, I... I essentially just like to engage in dialogue like this. I like to I like to have honest communication and see what where a person is willing to let themselves go and and, and their their place of uh, of honesty and stuff like that. And I watch I watch what what how people are living. I, I like to see what what they're doing for themselves. Like as far as they they taking one hundred percent responsibility for for themselves and for their recovery. And, and I see the certain lengths that they're going to improve and to change their lives. You can see that in an individual, like even as far as like an interview for a job, we've had people here that have filled out an application and applied and just sat there like a dud and gave us their paper and they had a ton of qualifications, but I didn't feel anything during the interview. And then we've had people that were underqualified that were just hungry for the job and they were relentless in pursuit of like calling and doing follow up emails and ask. I have a guy, Chris, right now that's working for me. He would tag me on Facebook. In random posts about hiring him on different opportunity things <laughs> on different jobs he would inbox me he'd instagram me he'd anytime like we would do stuff around here for like we we were fixing up a certain house or we doing clean outs and and we do a lot of like people accumulate back rent because they can't pay for whatever reason and we let them work it off by helping out around here or painting an apartment and and he didn't know back rent but he would show up to all those things and he would work what else? What do you need me to do? What else? What do you need me to do? No, nah, he just wanted that up. And he did it for three and a half straight months. And then uh, I hired him. He was really, and, and he was not only that, but he was at meetings. So at meetings that I was at, he was at meetings. He was raising, he was, he was, he was hungry for it, you know? One of the areas that I do research on is actually mentorship. And so I want to ask you, it sounds like you're engaged in a lot of mentor, mentoring relationships. Mm -hmm. What does a good mentor do and, and, um, and how do you try to go about doing that? For me, most important thing I try to do is lead by example. I don't try to tell people what to do. I, want, I try to show them what to do. My biggest thing is uh, when someone wants to get an idea of who I am, I don't want them to like ask me, I want them to ask other people on, on who they think I am. Um, like even when I've had different facilities come in here that maybe we're trying to get them to work with us and stuff like that, I encourage them to go to houses and to pull anybody aside and to ask a client or a resident in any house their perception of me instead of me trying to pitch you. Because a lot of people can, which I once did, right? Who, who I presented as and who I was when no one was watching were completely two, two separate things. So. Like even as far as like leadership here with staff and then, and then like in mentoring different people, sponsoring people, you got to get where you got to be willing to do the, the grunt work as well as the, and especially in recovery, grunt work is 
uh, I have 14 years clean. There's many excuses of why I don't have to go to meetings, why I don't have to sponsor a ton of guys. Why don't, of course, I can come up with a million valid justifications, I call them, but they're all both because essentially my foundation stems from the premise of helping people, right? Everything good in my life has come from helping people and it's undebatable, undeniable. And, uh, and so especially when I'm, when I'm sponsoring a guy, mentoring anybody in business, my philosophy has always been as far as the lead by example component, it's, it's not asking someone so much of what can you get them to do? It's showing them that what you're willing to do and getting them to want to strive to be more like you. It's like that, that whole concept is the greatest attribute as a leader is to get someone to do essentially with what you want them to do, but having them thinking it was their own idea, right? It's, it's, to, it's the whole getting them to be essentially where it is that you want them to be through. We don't have someone that sweeps the floor. We used to have someone here that worked as, um, he was a janitor in the place and, we paid him. He moved out. He was in our, he was in our community. We paid him. He was here for two years and he would come, he would clean and do the yard work and stuff like that. And he's no longer here. So staff comes in. I don't ask them to do anything. I, they just witness me cleaning toilets and sweeping and raking and taking out trash. And what do you think happens after they see that? Start doing it too. They, next thing you know, you see people taking out trash. You see someone nice. outside sprinkling salt on there. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I never asked anybody individually anything. Yeah. And I didn't come in here with a negative attitude, like, oh, I gotta do this and oh. It was just another day doing what I have to do. Yeah. Well, uh, so what's next for you? Where, where, does it, where do you go from here? Where do, you see the, where do you see the organization five years from now, let's say? I'm hoping, I'd like to have the full, full level of care. I'd like to have detox residential, PHP, IOP, outpatient recovery coaching, the full continuum of care. So you're literally, you can be with us for a year plus and there's nothing that we don't offer. So we're a, a complete one-stop shop and I'd like to, to continue to, to grow these businesses so we can continue to employ more people. But I think my next path, what my spirit's calling out to is, is um, I want to work with the youth. I want to do a mentorship with young adults, especially boys. Cause I think back on my young version of myself, if there was someone outside of like that component that I could have communicated some of that like anger or emotion that I was experiencing. Yeah. Um, it could have maybe changed the course, who knows? And I, I'm like, that's where I'm calling, that's where I'm being drawn to next. Like not necessarily like the kids, that, they may not be struggling with anything other than a broken home or a fatherless relationship or their dad's in prison or they don't have mentors or whatever, I, I want to focus in on that for, uh, just cause the best way to prevent what, what's happening now with the epidemic is, is to start when they're young to make sure that they get the information when they're young and, and not like the information, like don't do drugs, the information of like, it's okay to feel emotion. It's okay to cry. It's okay to communicate. It's okay to be vulnerable. Like, the necessary like stigma of what men are, what we're supposed to be and all that, which is so hard to break through the false pride and ego thing that we set for ourselves. But to, to be able to mold the youth into embracing that part of themselves and understanding the, the benefit of that, right? But we'll see. I did my, I have one more question for you I, and I meant to ask it earlier. Is there anything from a policy perspective that impedes you and your organization from um, providing the kind of services you'd like to provide. So is there some, are there laws, are there um, uh, government agencies that kind of, are there things that, that somebody could, you know, that, that could be changed in the policy space that would make it easier for you to, to provide services? Oh, for sure. There's not a lot of money in, so, the reason why there's not a lot of these specific places is because there's not a lot of, it's not a lot of money for it, right? There's not a lot of money you can make. Uh, the government gets behind, and this is my, this is my one little rant. 
So we have a pharmaceutical epidemic based off of, so the epidemic was stemmed from a pharma, pharmaceutical problem. If you do the research, you see what Purdue Pharma did. Um, it was heinous and, and that literally sp spread this thing like wildfire, which eventually led to what, what's happening now with the death epidemic because heroin is now fentanyl. And, and it all stemmed from an opioid epidemic, which led to the fentanyl epidemic now. And uh, so now the, the, the solution to that is pharmaceutical once again, which the pharmaceutical companies have created a synthetic opioid called buprenorphine, which is also known as Suboxone, which if you look at statistics and data through clinicians and through doctors, they'll say, Complete abstinence doesn't work because you can't track me because I'm anonymous, right? And they'll say this does work because we have data because you've been on the Suboxone Methadone Clinic for X amount of time. And, the, and, and the, the message that's being pushed out is the way to be off of drugs is to be on other drugs, but they're provided by us. And it's not that I don't believe in Suboxone. I don't believe in methadone. I don't believe it's the long-term solution. I believe that it should be a stepping stone or a short path that eventually leads you to the stuff that I believe in that is true freedom because ultimately you're still reliant on a substance. If you take someone that's on methadone, someone's on Suboxone and you take that Suboxone and methadone from them and you give them about six hours, they're going to start getting the physical convulsions and the sickness like they once got from the heroin. Although even worse now because there's a longer half-life in both those medications. Fentanyl actually leaves your system quicker. So all the money's being put into that from the state more more prescribers to prescribe more medication, to prescribe more drugs that are the solution for more drugs. And you wouldn't believe the amount of people that come into this place and they're coming from just a normal hospital and the doctor or their primary care has them on more drugs legally than they were on when they were on the street. They're just in different names and forms and they have cases of it. And I wish they'd get behind just our, our philosophies, right? It's the community connection, opportunity. It's, it's a, to invest more more time and money into the safe housing space, the, the treatment space, because it does work, and into the opportunity, right? Like the, like the workforce place now is incentivizing, Nashua is now incentivizing businesses to hire addicts, and they're giving them stipends. Like for, That's awesome. That's the first thing that I heard about this. One of the few things that, like, that they're doing, like, that's awesome. Like, that's... Like you get to, not only they'll pay for travel, they'll pay for training, the state, and they'll, they'll give you $4,000 to give the opportunity. That's huge. More of that, right? More of that instead of just drugging up someone that wants to not be drugged up more. Chris, thank you so much for sharing your, thank your, you so your much. story with me. Absolutely. I appreciate this. You've been listening to the Health Leader Forge a joint production of the College of Health and Human Services at the University of New Hampshire and the Northern New England Association of Healthcare Executives. Please go to our website, healthleaderforge.org, for more information or to leave comments about today's podcast. Look for Health Leader Forge podcasts on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and other podcast distribution sites. Thanks for being a part of the Health Leader Forge community and we'll talk with you again soon.